It's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Twenty-four years ago, to almost this very month, I gave a talk in Salt Lake City. It was called Joseph Smith and the Temple of Doom. And that talk was the beginning of really my public ministry as a born-again Christian. It caused a sensation. It also caused a couple of books to come out, my first two books. And uh, it also seems to have caused changes in the very fabric of the Mormon temple ceremony. So. Uh, 24 years later, we just felt it would be a good idea to update this, to do it in a more comprehensive way with more, with more up-to-date materials and better graphics and all that because a lot of technical things have improved over the last 24 years. So we're going to talk about Joseph Smith and the Temple of Doom. Um, to begin with, though, I want to read a passage from Scripture that is very appropriate, especially for Mormons. Uh, in Galatians chapter 1, Paul says this, starting in verse 6. He says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that has called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, though an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And as we have said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now, that's pretty strong. It's one of the stronger statements that Paul makes in any of his epistles. And what's interesting about Mormonism is that if you study it through, it is in fact another gospel. And it was supposedly started by an angel. Uh, we're going to talk about that history in a few minutes. Um, but first I want to just explain how I came to be talking about this topic. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on my background. I spent many years in the occult, Freemasonry, even Satanism, all kinds of stuff. But one pivotal moment took place in 1973. I was being made a Druid. I was studying to be a Druid high priest on Arkansas. And the guy who was the Grand Master Druid of North America told my wife and I something very amazing. He said, if we ever got in trouble, that we should seek out and join the Mormon Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, because it was started by witches for witches. as a place where we could go and we could kind of hide out, pretend to be, you know, very straight, normal, all-American Christian people, and yet actually believe almost all the same stuff that witches believe. 
Now at the time, I didn't know much about Mormons except that they had a choir. You know, like, like most people in the Midwestern United States, I, I knew very little about Mormonism. I had vague some idea that, that they had a lot of wives and they had a, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, and that was about the extent of it. So I just filed that away and, and, and forgot about it. Well, I got deeper and deeper into the occult and uh, into very, very serious uh, dark stuff. And just about at, at the bottom of my, of my spiritual journey, when things were looking the darkest, a, a, uh, I had sent a check off to the Church of Satan. And when the check came back from the bank in San Francisco, some lady at the bank there had written on the check, I'll be praying for you in the name of Jesus. Because I'd you know, written a check to the Church of Satan, she figured I was in pretty bad trouble. Well, I just laughed about it, but because of that event, she started praying for me and her whole life fell apart. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, the Lord arranged to get me the gospel in the form of a couple of Christian comic books, so I spurned. And so the very next day, a knock came at the door, and it was two Mormon missionaries. And at this point in my life, and, and to a lesser degree in, in my wife Sharon's life, we were, we were like thinking, this couldn't get much worse. And all of a sudden, this was like a bolt from the blue, and we remembered what this Grand Master Druid had told us way back in 1973, because this was now 1980. And uh, we thought, well, maybe this is a sign. You know, we should join the Mormon church. <laughs> and so we, we told the missionaries to come back because we had to leave at that time to go shopping or something. And uh, within a few weeks, we joined the Mormon church. And along the way, as we were taking these discussions that they give you, you know, to explain about the church, we'd ask them these questions. Oh, do you believe like in a heavenly mother? Oh, yeah, we do. And they were kind of surprised that we even knew about that and that we knew about the law of eternal progression, which is the idea that you can become a god, and, and several other ideas which are common between Mormonism and, and, and the Druidic rite of witchcraft. So we joined the church, um, and one of the things that this, this Druid guy had told us back in 1973 was is that we should try and get to go to the temple, because the Mormon temple, which is not, by the way, available to all Mormons, uh, when most people think of a temple, they think of, okay, like a Jewish synagogue or something like that, where you know, you can walk in off the street and, you know, worship there or whatever. That's not the case with a Mormon temple. Uh, there are Mormon meeting houses in most every city, but there are only, well, now I don't know how many there are, but there's only, comparatively speaking, a handful of temples in North America. There might be, by now, you know, 20 or 30 temples in North America, but there's hundreds of meeting houses. And those temples you can only get into if you hold a temple recommend. Therefore, the elite of the LDS church. And so after a year, I was ordained an elder and uh, was both my wife and I were considered worthy. We went out to the Salt Lake Temple. And just as we had, um, just as we had been told by this, this Grand Master Druid guy, it was indeed very occultic. It was very Luciferian. And we'll talk more about that later. Uh, so basically, the Mormon church was used by God to bring me to a place where I knew I needed a savior. Because for the first time in my life, Mormons, I think most of you who are watching this know, are very good people. They try to live according to Christian principles. They, they have very strong views on things like chastity, uh, you know, before marriage, they're pro-life. They, they try and live decent moral lives. And in, in most respects, they look Christian. And so as a Mormon, for the first time in many years, I was trying to be a good guy. I was trying to not smoke dope. I was trying to not, you know, fornicate or commit adultery or do any of the things that witches do. And, you know, I was, you know, not entirely succeeding in some of that. And, uh, but it was a process. And I realized as I began, and then what happened was, to bring this story to a close, I was called, first of all, to be an elders quorum president. And then I was called to teach a course in the New Testament for the Church Institute of Religion, which is like an adult seminary program that's run by Brigham Young University. And so I was teaching the New Testament, so for the first time in my life I actually read through the entire New Testament. Even though I had a master's degree in theology from the Catholic Church, I had never read the New Testament from, uh, from the beginning of Matthew all the way to Revelation. And so as I read through especially Paul's epistles, I came to understand that there was no way that Paul could have been a Mormon. And I tell people, you know, the best piece of anti-Mormon literature I have ever read is the Bible. And fortunately, the Mormon church uses the King James Bible. And so as I was reading this Bible, and I was, I was going out and doing the various things that you do if you're an elders quorum president, one of those things was home teaching. Now, home teaching is where you go and, and you visit families 
in the local congregation, which is called a ward in Mormonism, uh, every month. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, you kind of see if they need anything, especially like if they're older people or maybe it's a widow or something that needs to have her sidewalk shoveled or her gutters cleaned or her lawn mowed. And then the elders quorum goes and helps out. And all that's uh, very noble. But some of the people I visited, because I was the elders quorum president, the, the bishop of the ward suggested I should visit these people that were kind of, they were called inactive. In, in, inactive meant that they would never, hardly ever go to church. And they thought, well, I could maybe get them to be active again. And so I'd go and visit them, and I discovered in many cases it was because they couldn't live up to all the rules that Mormonism has. And I know there was one fellow who, especially to this day, I'll never forget him. Uh, his name was Clarence, and he was a 40-some-year-old deacon. Now you might think, what's the weird thing about that? Well, you've got to realize in Mormonism, most deacons are 12 years old because they have this kind of strange idea to most of other Christian denominations that when you become, if you're a boy, when you become 12 years old, you become a deacon. When you become, I think it's 14 years old, you become a teacher. When you become 16 years old, you're ordained a priest. So every 16-year-old boy in the Mormon church, unless they're a real creep, is a priest. And then when you get 18, if you're righteous, you become an elder. So we used to joke that, you know, that there were elders in the Mormon church that weren't even old enough to shave yet. But, but they were elders. And then it goes on from there. So this guy, however, was stuck at being a deacon. You know why? Because he smoked. And as most of you know, Mormons believe you can't smoke, you can't drink, you can't even drink coffee. In fact, we used to have a joke that Brigham Young University was the only university in America where coffee was a controlled substance. So you could not, you could not do any of these things. And this guy couldn't give up smoking. And as many of you know, smoking is not an easy thing to get rid of in your life. I mean, it's a very hard addiction to break. And so um, we would pray for this guy. I'd give him holy Melchizedek priesthood blessings. He'd fast together, and he just could not get rid of the smoking. And he'd be in church every time the doors were open. He was very faithful, but he'd sit there, and everybody around him could smell the cigarette smoke on his clothing. And they knew that he wasn't keeping the word of wisdom, which is what the the dietary rules in Mormonism are called. They're called the Word of Wisdom. So finally, you know, the bishop and I were talking, and the bishop literally had tears in his eyes. This guy really cared about this Clarence fellow. And he says, you know, in a way it would almost have been better if he hadn't joined the church because he knows what's right, and yet he won't do it. And, and he's going to be judged more harshly than someone who's out there who's a Catholic or a Baptist or a Lutheran or whatever. And that's something we'll talk about a little later, how that whole thing works in Mormon theology. So to me, that was kind of the beginning of some very serious questions. And I remember one night I went home and uh, was sitting there reading my Bible. And I read, it just happened to fall open to um, Matthew 11. And I remember, you know, sitting there, because again, this is a King James Bible, thankfully. And in Matthew 11, there's that passage where it talks about the yoke you know, the yoke of Christ. And uh, I remember that, you know how you read the Bible and sometimes something just leaps out at you? Because at this time I was pretty exhausted. I mean, I was home teaching all these people and I was doing all the other stuff that, I mean, I was working basically 40 hours a week for me and 40 hours a week for the Mormon church. And if you talk to Mormon, Mormon uh, priesthood holders, you'll find out that's not at all unusual. They really expect a lot from their people. So I was reading 11 and starting in verse 28, and Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And I thought, boy, you know, I, I was working so hard, and I thought of people like this poor Clarence, and other people that I was visiting that were struggling, that just could not get it, they, they were, were stuck and they were not able to, for all intents and purposes, they were damned, even though they were members of the church, and we'll talk about why that is in a few minutes. But, and a little voice, a still small voice inside of my head said, go to Matthew 23, 1. Now, at this time in my life, I did not know the Bible very well at all. Uh, and so I thought, well, this is kind of strange. I'm going to go to Matthew 23, 1 and see what that is. So I went to that verse. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do, not, do you not after their works, for they say and do not. And then verse 4 is what really hit me. 
For they bind heavy burdens, and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. And I just, that just smote me in my heart. And I thought to myself, that's, I'm like a Pharisee. Because I'm laying these burdens on all these different people in the ward. And it wasn't me, of course. It was the, the, the church that I was representing. And even though I prayed for them, even though I, I counseled with them, even though I fasted for them, they were still under this heavy burden. And that was kind of the beginning of the end. And finally what happened was is um, my wife wanted to go to nursing school, and so we moved out of Milwaukee, which is where we were at that time with the church, and we moved back to my wife's hometown of Dubuque, Iowa. And so I started going to the Mormon meeting house there. And um, while I was there, I, I couldn't get a job right away. And so I found this thing in the paper one day about a prophecy seminar. And I thought, oh boy, I belong to a church with a living prophet. You know, I can go there and I can really wild them with my knowledge of scripture. Especially because I just finished teaching a course in the book of Revelation. So I went to this seminar and it was the first time in my life. I was probably, what, about 34 years old at this time. And I had never encountered a guy that really knew the Bible before. This evangelist was running this meeting. This guy, he had answers for everything, just bam, bam, bam. And no matter what I said, because I was sitting in the audience asking all these troublesome questions, and he had an answer for everything. He knew his Bible. And finally, I brought up the one thing that Mormons do with Protestants of whatever stripe, because they think it more or less shoots down the whole Protestant religion. I said to this guy, where do you get the authority to baptize people so they can be saved? And the fellow just smiled at me, because he knew that wasn't my issue. The whole authority issue was a side you know, that was a rabbit trail. He says, where do you get the idea you have to be baptized in order to be saved? It says in Acts 16, 31, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And that was the verse that God had for me. It just you know, went right through my magic Mormon underwear and hit me right in the heart. And uh, I believe God has that, that kind of a verse for every unsaved individual. And I went home that night and um, I was trembling. I remember my hands were shaking on the steering wheel as I drove home. And I thought, could it really be that simple? Just believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And so I went home and in, in, the, in the Doctrine and Covenants, which is one of the, the works of Mormon scripture, they have a, a, a chapter that gives you advice on spiritual discernment. And it says if you're confronted with some profound, deep question, you, have to, you should pray and fast. And if the, true, if the answer is true, you'll get a burning in your bosom. And if the answer is false, the Lord will send you a stupor and you will forget even what the issue was. Well, I prayed and I fasted and I didn't get either one. You know, and I say that's, that's the LDS approach of spiritual discernment. You ought to get heartburn or you get stupid. Well, I didn't get either one. And so ultimately I thought, well, I've tried every other God-forsaken thing in the world because at this point in my life I pretty much had done so. I remembered those comic books, and I remember they had a little four-step thing where, okay, this is how you get born again. So I went to the closet, pulled out the comic books, and knelt at the foot of my bed. Take off, I took off my magic Mormon underwear because I didn't want any static on the line when I was praying to God, and I prayed the, the sinner's prayer, so to speak, that was in the back of those books, and I got born again. Gloriously saved. That was 1984, June 22nd. And... Uh, at, at, I, it was a profound experience, but I didn't really understand, okay, now what do I do with this in terms of Mormonism? Because I still was attending the church, but I could tell everybody else was, I was interacting with everybody else differently because I, I was full of all this joy and peace and energy, and they were all kind of, uh, you know, trudging along with their, you know, put the shoulder to the wheel, you know, that's a Mormon hymn, you know, like you got to put the, soldier, the shoulder to your wheel and move along, you know. Trudge, trudge, trudge. And I didn't trudge anymore. I was like walking on air. And after about nine months of, of the Holy Spirit and of, of just being excited about the Lord, I finally demanded to have a high council court to have my name taken off the church rolls. And it's interesting. What I did was at that time I was putting together all this research about the Mormon temple. And the germ of this talk was what came out of that. And when I went to the high council court, what, the, what I should explain what this is, there's, in the Mormon hierarchy, there's a ward, which is like run by a bishop and two counselors, and above them is a stake center, not S-T-E-A-K, S-T-A-K-E, -E, and that's run by a stake president and two counselors, and then the stake high counselors, of which there are 12. 
And um, so I went before the stake high council. And the rules are, it's a trial. And I could speak on my own behalf, and they couldn't interrupt me once I had the floor. And so for two hours, I witnessed to them. I gave them all this stuff about the occult roots of the Mormon temple. <laughs> and I told them about the gospel of grace. I told them about Jesus Christ. And at the end of the two hours, they were all like, you know, I mean, their jaws were almost on the floor. And finally, the state president knew he had to say something because they, they had no answers. And he said, well, I just want to bear you my testimony that the Book of Mormon is true and Jesus is the Christ and Spencer W. Kimball is a prophet of God, you know, and he was crying, of course. And uh, that's what Mormons do when, they're, when their back is against the wall. They bury you their testimony. And so I figured, well, I, I did what God told me to do. And uh, I, I sowed seeds, and I pray those seeds bear fruit. And um, a few months after that, I was asked to give this talk, uh, Temple of Doom out in Salt Lake City, and the rest, as they say, is history. It was soon after that the Lord called me into the ministry. So that, that's basically my story of how I got into Mormonism and how I came out of it. Now, admittedly, I was not your typical Mormon convert. Most Mormons, when they join the church, are not former witches. But that doesn't really matter. I was very sincere, and there was no question that I really was trying to be a good Mormon for some five years that I was a member of the church. So the point is, the Mormon gospel and the Christian gospel are very different things, and we're going to understand why that is shortly. But first, let's talk about the history of Mormonism. Uh, most people know Mormonism was started by a fellow named Joseph Smith. Uh, Smith was born in the early part of the 19th century. Uh, actually, he was Joseph Smith, Jr. His father, Joseph Smith, Sr., was a kind of a good-for-nothing fellow. He was involved with the occult. He was involved with water witching and divination. He claimed to be a treasure seeker. He claimed he could, he could use his, his magical wand to go out and find buried treasure, which was a very popular thing people would do back in those days because fairly you know, recently, before this time, uh, pirates were sailing up and down the East Coast of, of America, because this is right after the Revolutionary War, and it was believed that there was buried treasure hidden here and there throughout the countryside in upstate New York. And so this Joseph Smith Sr. claimed to be able to find this stuff through his occult power. Uh, his mother, Lucy Mack Smith, said in her autobiography that the family cast magic circles and practiced the faculty of abrac. Now you might ask, what the heck is that? Well. The faculty of abrac, you may have heard the term abracadabra. That's actually a real magical word from a magical workbook. And the faculty of abrac meant that they were practicing ceremonial magic. So imagine, here's this young man who, along with his brother, was raised in a family. Actually, there was a couple other brothers, but we'll get to them later. Uh, <clears throat> totally involved in the occult. And he'd never been exposed to religion. But now, here's an inter interesting thing that happened. During that time, there were these revivals that were sweeping the United States. And, you know, the, the, many of you have read stories about the Great Awakening and then revivals that followed that. And it got so many revivals hitting the area, they actually called the area where Joseph Smith was raised, which was Palmyra, New York, the burned over district because it was like first the Presbyterians would come through and they'd have a revival. And then the congregations would come through and they'd have a revival. And then the Methodists would come through. You get the point, you know. Everybody was getting saved and there was all this religious fervor. And um, so Joseph Smith Jr., who was a young man, I think he was like 15 or 16 at the time, he was exposed to some of this revivalistic fury, um, fervor. <coughs> and he got the family Bible off the shelf. It was obviously very dusty. He never read it. And he was trying to decide what church to join because the Methodists were on him from one side and saying, you should become a Methodist. And I forget what the other church was, that you know, other congregational or Presbyterian was on him from the other side and he should join that. And so he happened to open up the Bible for the first time in his life and it fell upon James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not and it shall be given him. So he thought, well, that makes good sense. So he figured, I'm going to go out in the woods and I'm going to pray and ask God what church to join. Now, mind you, this is, this is the official story. There are actually nine versions of this which disagree with each other, but I'm going to give you the official version just because it's, it's simpler. Uh, but just, just realize if you start digging into this history, 
it's full of contradictions. So he, anyhow, the story is he went out into this, in, near his home, to what's called today the sacred grove, quote unquote. And he knelt there and he began to pray. Now, now notice what happens here. He's praying to ask God what church to join. And supposedly, all of a sudden, he felt overcome with this vast darkness. And, and he felt as if he would suffocate and die. The darkness was so profound. And then through this darkness, this pillar of light comes down. You know, and, and in this pillar of light are two glorious beings in white robes that look virtually identical. They have white hair, white beards, and white robes, and they look just like each other. And these were two personages that he describes as being beyond description in terms of how glorious they appeared. And the first personage gestures to the second one and says, This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. And the second personage, who is supposedly Jesus, tells Joseph Smith that he should not join any church because all the churches of that time were wicked. And, you know, basically he said they had a form of godliness, but they denied the power thereof. And that they, you know, were teaching for commandments the doctrines of men rather than his commandments. And that instead, he should go and wait for their instructions. And Jesus supposedly also said that all churches currently active in America, or anywhere for that matter, were, <clears throat> excuse me, an abomination in his sight. So, whoa, that would be a pretty heavy message. And so what does Joseph Smith do? Well, paradoxically, he goes back, and within two weeks after he supposedly had that vision, he joins the Methodist church. It's like, uh, 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 uh. You know, because, I mean, if I had something like that happen, I don't think I'd run right out and do exactly the opposite of what the vision told me to do, but he did. And he was in that church for a few weeks, but you know what? The Methodists kicked him out. You know why they kicked him out? Because he was an occultist and a glass looker. Now, what's a glass looker? Well, that's an old-fashioned word for a scryer. And you probably don't know what that is either, because that's a technical word in the occult. A scryer is someone who has a crystal ball. And he looks in the crystal ball, and he finds stuff. And Joseph Smith, like his father, claimed to be able to find buried treasure by looking in a crystal ball. And of course, no self-respecting Methodist would stand for that kind of behavior. So they threw him out. Well, to make a long story short, he was visited later in his bedroom by this glorious being who claimed to be the angel Moroni. <clears throat> now, I know if you've read the Bible, you've never heard of the angel Moroni, but that's okay. He's not in the Bible. Moroni is actually a, a dead prophet from the New World, according to Mormonism. He, he lived on the American continent some 1,200 years before this date, which was in the 1820s. And uh, supposedly, he told Joseph Smith that there was this book that told the history of Christian civilization in pre-Columbian America. And that if every year, Joseph Smith would go to this site and the angel would see if he was worthy. And after three years, Finally, and again, I'm giving you the official version. There's a lot of, of very sinister stuff that we won't have time to get into here about this. Uh, but interestingly enough, every year this, the anniversary of this visitation was on a witch holiday, September 21st, which is the equinox. And in the third year, finally, on top of a hill somewhat near his home, he was allowed to dig up this book. And what it was, it was a box containing golden plates. And every plate was solid gold. And that supposedly they were held together by these kind of wire-like things. And they were written in some unknown language. And so he was allowed to take the plates, and he was given a mission to translate these plates. From later on, we learned that they were written in Reformed Egyptian. Don't ask me what Reformed Egyptian is, because nobody knows. But anyway, so he brings these plates back and um, starts translating them. And the, the, just to be very brief, because... Um, this is a very involved thing. The Book of Mormon, which is what these plates came to be known as, covers a period supposedly from 2247 B.C. to 421 A.D. And the, the story is basically that during the time of Jeremiah the prophet, when Israel was sliding into apostasy, that this family of righteous um, Jews, headed by a guy named Lehi, uh, was told by God to leave Jerusalem and sail across the Pacific Ocean to a new world. And so this family does it. And they, they go across the, Atlant or the Pacific Ocean and land somewhere, we don't exactly know where, in the new world, probably in either Central or South America, and they set up a civilization there. 
and this guy had two main, two main sons, Nephi and Laman. And Nephi is a good guy, and Laman is a bad guy. He's like kind of the, the cane, if you will, of the family, the black sheep. And his descendants come to be known as Lamanites, and Nephites, Nephi's descendants are, of course, known as Nephites. And, and so the Lamanites gradually become more and more wicked, and, and eventually, now this is important, they are cursed with a dark skin for their, un, for their unrighteousness. And they become the American Indians. That's the, the Mormon explanation of where the Native Americans came from, is that they are, this, they are Lamanites. And they, uh, they are cursed with that dark skin because of the fact that they, uh, they were wicked. The Nephites, however, are described in the Book of Mormon as being white and delightsome because they were good and they were righteous. So anyhow, there's these various battles that go back and forth. And I'll tell you, the, I mean, the Book of Mormon, I actually, I need a medal from somebody because I actually read the Book of Mormon through five times. And it's not for nothing that Mark Twain described the Book of Mormon as chloroform in print. It is very, very seriously boring. In fact, believe it or not, one of the books, because just like, you know, the Bible has books in it, you know, the Book of Esther, the Book of Ruth, the Book of Jeremiah, whatever. The Book of Mormon also has books in it. And one of the later books in the Book of Mormon is called the Book of Ether. Yeah, it's really called Ether. And Mark Twain said he read the Book of Ether and it put him to sleep. So it's a very boring and complicated book. In fact, somebody said that Joseph Smith, when he put the book together, he must have thought he was getting paid by the word because it's very wordy, it's, it's very verbose, and it, it just, anyway, it's not an easy book to read. But to very try to s synthesize it together, after the coming of Christ in Jerusalem and, you know, Bethlehem and all that, they, um, what happens is when Christ is crucified, over in the Holy Land, in the New World, these cataclysmic events take place. There's earthquakes, there's signs in the heavens, and then after Jesus over in Jerusalem raises from the dead, he appears in the sky over the New World. And he comes down from heaven and sets up a church in the New World. And he has 12 apostles, it just like, it's like a, a duplicate of the church that he sets up over in Jerusalem. And, and so everything is wonderful for a while. And he teaches all these gospel principles, you know, to these people who are at this time made up of both Lamanites and Nephites. And then he goes back up to heaven just like he did in the, you know, in, with the ascension in the, in the Bible. But then, of course, apostasy hits. And they start deteriorating. They become unrighteous. And one of the interesting things is the Book of Mormon teaches that when, excuse me, the Lamanites repented and became righteous and were baptized, when they were baptized according to the ordinances of the gospel that Jesus taught, they turned white. So, you know, it's kind of a very racist book. So anyway, there's, they start apostatizing and there's, there's this righteous remnant that is left behind of the Nephites that are led by two, two guys. One guy is named Mormon and the other guy is named Moroni. And in Mormon doctrine, it's believed that when you die, if you're a righteous person, you become an angel. So that's why you have this angel Moroni showing up in Joseph Smith's bedroom. Uh, and anyway, by the year 421, there's hardly any Nephites left. And this, this battle is taking place with hundreds of thousands of people whacking away at each other with armor and swords and breastplates and, you know, all this stuff on this hill in upstate New York that's come to be known as Hill Cumorah. And before the last Nephite is killed, who I think, as I recall, was Moroni, he buries these gold plates, which contains this whole history, in this hill, in, a, in like a, a box, you know, inside of a little stone vault. And they sit there from 421 all the way up until the 1820s when Joseph Smith is led to dig them up. Okay, after this, he, he meets some people, and he meets this one guy, and I'm not going to know all the details, that gave him enough money to actually publish this book after he's translated. And there, there's so many things about this book that are in, in, in its translation and whatnot that are really very bogus. I mean, believe me, you have to really have, have your eyes deceived to the max to believe all the stuff about the LDS Church. Um, but in 1830, he started his own church. It was originally called the Church of Christ. And later on, it came to be known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 
And they taught that this is the only Christian church for the first time in 1,500 years because they taught that, that back in the days of Constantine, the original church that Jesus Christ started went into apostasy. And so from the period of around 300, <coughs> excuse me, all the way up until 1830, there was no church anywhere on the face of the earth. And that's kind of bizarre when you think about it. And then Joseph Smith restored this gospel. Now, I got to tell you about the great baptismal charade. Because, see, Mormonism teaches that nobody can be saved unless they're baptized by someone who has authority. Now, that, in a way, kind of makes sense. Uh, and they claim nobody had authority. And so at one point, Joseph Smith and one of his right-hand guys, Oliver Cowdery, I believe it was, were near, I think it was in Ohio, they were, uh, maybe Pennsylvania, I'm sorry, uh, on the banks of the Susquehanna River. And they had a vision where John the Baptist shows up. And John the Baptist says, you guys need to be baptized. And he's like a glorified, resurrected being, you know. And you'd think he would like maybe either baptize them or lay hands on them and give them the authority to baptize them, but he didn't do that. Instead, he says, you go down into the river, and Joseph baptized Oliver, and then lay hands on him to receive the Aaronic priesthood. And then Oliver baptized Joseph, and then you lay hands on him to receive the Aaronic priesthood. And, you know, you re this is in Doctrine and Covenants, which is one of the scriptures of the church. And you're sitting there going, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> it's like, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Because neither one of them had the authority to baptize. You know, because you can't be baptized. You can't, you can't have the Aaronic priesthood unless you're baptized. And you get the point. I mean, it's, it's, it's like totally confused. And, of course, it says in the Bible that God is not an author of, the author of confusion. Now, let's talk about the character of Joseph Smith. Because let me tell you, this guy was a genuine piece of work. I mean, he was a really unique individual. <clears throat> in many ways, he was quintessentially American. I mean, um, he could have been a con man. He could have been a sorcerer. He could have been any number of things, but he was not a true prophet. Um, just as an example, um, he was a boaster. At one point in his life, this is what he said. He said, I have more to boast of than any other man. No man on earth has done such a great work as I have done. Even Jesus Christ has not done so great a work as I have done. No man has ever been able to keep a church together. Not Jesus, not Paul, not Peter, but I am able to do it. He claimed at one point that he was descended from Jesus Christ. Hello, Da Vinci Code. Uh, he was a glass looker, which means he, he was a sorcerer. He, he was a money digger, and I don't mean in a sense like, you know, he was trying to marry rich women, but he, he believed he could, he could tell people where to go and dig up buried treasure, and he actually was convicted of that at one point for being a glass looker and a disorderly person. The Mormon church also teaches that when we die, all of us, it doesn't matter if we're Mormons or not, we're going to go before the judgment bar, and we're going to face three people. God the Father, God the Son, and Joseph Smith. And he is going to be one of our three judges. And I already mentioned he was a Methodist before they kicked him out. He also joined the Freemasons. We're going to talk more about that later. And he also, by revelation, married many other men's wives. He was an, a serial adulterer. At the time of his death, he had 27 wives that we know of. And many of them were actually married to other men. Uh, and interestingly enough, Nowadays, for example, uh, a couple of years ago, this talk was given in 2010, uh, we had this FLDS church thing coming out, the uh, fundamentalist Latter-day Saint church that uh, was accused of, of trafficking and polygamy and, and underage girls being taken across state lines to be married to old guys and, and all this kind of ungodly stuff. And of course, the Utah Mormons are saying, we have nothing to do with this. This is nothing like our church. Our church is good. We don't teach this kind of stuff. The funny thing is, is that for mo we'll talk more about this later, but just I'll throw this one little nugget at you right now. Joseph Smith got this revelation for about plural marriage, and <clears throat> the first woman that God supposedly told him to marry was a young girl who was living in his home. Her name was Fanny Alger, and she was either 15 or 16 years old. So this whole thing about the Mormons being so self-righteous that, oh, no, we don't, we don't marry underage girls. Well, their founding prophet did, and that's a matter of record. 
He also died an occultist, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So Joseph Smith, his first plural wife, was a 15-year-old girl, and that is a matter of public record. Okay, uh, moving along, because there's, there's a lot of stuff we can kind of glide over here. Uh, the church suffered persecution, which is not unexpected, and uh, they went from Kirkland, Ohio, where they built their first temple. Uh, they were run out of Kirkland, Ohio. They went to Missouri, where Joseph Smith thought that that was actually the Garden of Eden, was in uh, near Missouri, Independence, Missouri. Then they were run out of Missouri, and they finally ended up uh, kind of in the frontier, the west, the eastern uh, side of the Mississippi, in a town called Nauvoo, Illinois, where they set up their own little Mormon colony. And by the time they got firmly established there, they had started sending out missionaries all over the world. And so all these Mormons were coming from England, from Germany, and of course from various parts of America. And Nauvoo became the largest city in Illinois. It was bigger than Chicago at the time. And Joseph Smith ruled it like a tiny kingdom. It was here that he became a Freemason. And uh, interestingly enough, a few weeks after he became a Master Mason is when he introduced the secret temple ceremonies. It was in the Nauvoo period that it also started to come out uh, the idea of plural marriage, that, that this was part of, of Mormon doctrine, that what was called the new and everlasting covenant of marriage was the idea that you had to have more than one wife in order to truly be saved. And that's in section 132 of Doctrine and Covenants, again, Mormon scripture, and it's still there to this day. We'll talk a little more about that later. Part of what happened during this time is that, believe it or not, at this time, Joseph was crowned king of the United States. He ran for president in 1844, but in the middle of that, he was arrested for inciting a mob in Nauvoo to riot and trash a printing office. Now, why did that happen? Well, the, the printing office had printed a newspaper accusing Joseph Smith of polygamy, which was, of course, true. But he denied it, and he had the printing press destroyed. Because of the riots, the governor felt that they had to send in the, um, the troops, and to avoid a major scene, Joseph Smith allowed himself to be arrested. And he was taken to Carthage Jail in Carthage, Illinois, a few miles away from uh, Nauvoo, and there he was shot by a mob. And that was the end of Joseph Smith's life. And it's interesting, uh, he's described as a martyr by the Mormon church. Both he and his brother Hymer were killed by a mob which isn't right. I mean, they were, that was a great, great sin. His last words, the Mormon church teaches that his last words were, my Lord and my God. Well, not quite. Actually, local witnesses say what he said was, O Lord my God, is there no help for the widow's son? Which is kind of creepy for two reasons. One reason is that he really was the son of a widow. But the other one is, is that's the grand Masonic hailing sign of distress which is supposedly a thing Masons do if they're in grave danger of losing their lives, and it's a way that they can cry out for Masons to help them. But, of course, nobody did. And the other interesting thing about Joseph Smith's death, his murder, is that Mormons call him a martyr. And actually, that wasn't entirely true, because he had a gun, a pistol that was smuggled into him in the jail, and he was shooting back at the people who were trying to kill him. And again, I'm not in any way excusing what this mob did. It was very wrong. It was murder. But, I mean, can you imagine, like, Stephen, the first martyr in the Bible, you know, like they're stoning him and he's picking up the rocks and throwing them back at them? I mean, that's not martyrdom. Martyrdom is just going to your death like Yeshua went to his death, like a, like a meek lamb to the slaughter. So Joseph Smith was not a martyr. He was a murder victim, but he was not a martyr. Now, after his death, there was a struggle for power. Um, Smith had left a revelation behind that his son, Joseph Smith III, should be his successor as prophet, but this son was only a child right now. Uh, Brigham Young, who was the senior apostle at the time and a very forceful personality in his own right, staged a bloodless coup and became the new prophet. Uh, Emma Smith, Joseph's widow, well, his first wife, <laughs> uh, left Nauvoo with her son, and they later started up the LD, our LDS church, which is the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints which exists today as the other major Mormon, although they don't call themselves Mormon, uh, Restoration Church down in uh, Independence, Missouri. And it's interesting, to this day, many people don't realize this, there's actually more than 150 splinter groups off the uh, LDS Church. The reorganized LDS Church is just the largest, but there are many others. And I'm showing you a picture now in the slides of the Temple Lot Church, 
which is one of the churches that owns the actual site where Joseph Smith prophesied there would be a temple built in his generation back in the 1840s, and of course, or the 30s, and of course it never happened. That's one of many false prophecies Joseph Smith made. And uh, you also see here in another slide a picture of the temple that the RLDS church built, which as you can see is an amazingly uh, <coughs> weird structure. It is very uh, phallic. In fact, even the local RLDS people call it the great screw-up for reasons that should be obvious. Anyhow, the Mormons were kind of driven out of Nauvoo soon after that. Uh, and Brigham Young decided it was better to kind of, so to speak, get out of Dodge. And so he figured what they're going to do is move west to where there were no other white people. And the government couldn't bother them anymore. And so by revelation, he told everybody to pack up all their belongings and get into hand carts and trundle across the prairie. And he went out and said, okay, we're going to start anew in this valley of the Great Salt Lake. And of course, everybody knows that that became the state of Utah. And by revelation, Brigham told everybody, okay, you're going to go out in these hand carts. And what he forgot to do is consider the fact that it takes a long time to walk pushing a hand cart from Illinois to Utah. And winter was coming. And so literally hundreds and hundreds of people, faithful Mormons died in the snow or of, of exposure or of starvation or of Indians or whatever getting shot by bows and arrows, you know, trying to make the trek. And to this day, if you live in Utah and you can trace your lineage back to someone who came across the prairies in a handcart, that's a big deal because it's like you're, you're really in the Mormon church if you descended from the handcart people. But actually, it's kind of a bad deal because Brigham Young made some very serious errors in doing it. Now, once they set up king, this little Mormon kingdom out there, they called it the Kingdom of Deseret. And polygamy was practiced openly, um, and Young ruled the, the kingdom like a religious tyrant. There was a lot of oppression of women. He had enforcers that were known as Danites and or as avenging angels that would go out and they would kill people that were uh, not following the Mormon gospel. And word of all this started getting back to the United States government. And outcries were in Congress to, to go in and solve the Mormon problem because there were all these stories of women who were being oppressed. And, and some of it was sensational, of course. I mean, it was, some of it was even worse than it really was. But, I mean, you know how the media is even back then with, with newspapers and all that. So they actually sent in the troops. And uh, there was what was called the Mormon Wars. And by that time, a different guy was prophet. His name was Wilford Woodruff. And the church basically came in, and uh, not, pardon, not the church, the government came in and said, if you don't stop this polygamy, we're going to take away all your assets. We're going to take away your buildings. We're going to take away your money. And you're going to be ruined. Because by that time, the church had built quite a prosperous little setup there in Utah. And so Wilfred Woodruff in 1890 had a revelation. And they did away with plural marriage, at least officially. And that enabled a few years later for Utah to be able to become a state. Now what happened is, is the church got more and more established throughout the beginning of the 20th century. They tried to put polygamy behind them. And um, they began to move in the mainstream in the 1950s and 60s. They even had a guy, a Mormon, run for president, George Romney. And he lost the presidential nomination probably because of the LDS church's stand on black people. And for those of you that may not know this, for many years the Mormon church taught that black people are cursed with a dark skin because they were not valiant in the pre-existence. See, Mormon doctrine is that um, all of us lived in a pre-existent state before we came here to earth. And that, that there was this battle in heaven between Lucifer and the fallen angels and all of us who were good people and that the people who ended up being black sat it out and wait to see who would win. And so because of their being so, you know, whatever you want to call it, lazy, I guess, they were cursed with a black skin. And all the early Mormon prophets taught all this really racist stuff like, you know, as recently as Joseph Smielding, Fielding Smith in the 1940s, he said black people were all loathsome and shiftless and lazy and crooked and that no black man would ever get the priesthood. I mean, really racist stuff. Uh, blacks were allowed to join the church, but they could not be, hold the priesthood and they could not be sealed in the temple. And interracial marriage is a nearly unpardonable sin. And LDS leaders for many years taught 
that the African race is cursed and inferior in every possible way. But by the 1970s, with the Civil Rights Movement, which started in the 1960s, increasing pressure from the United States government and other governments in the world, because by now the Mormon Church was an international church, that, that uh, the church was pressured to do something about this. So Prophet Spencer W. Kimball had another new revelation. Now blacks have full access to LDS offices and LDS temples since 1978. Now, what are the cornerstones of the Mormon faith? Well, first of all, they teach that there was this great apostasy, that sometime around the second or third century, the Church of Jesus Christ began to apostatize after the death of the last apostle. By the time of Constantine, they teach there was no true Christian church left anywhere in the world. The world was therefore in spiritual darkness for more than 1,200 years. Uh, the light began to dawn, they say, with Luther, Calvin, and the Reformation. But it remained for Joseph Smith, Jr. to come along and restore the fullness of the everlasting gospel. Another cornerstone is that you need living prophets, that there must always be a living prophet on the earth to help people interpret the scriptures. And they have a saying that a living prophet is better than a dead prophet. So in other words, the current living prophet, whoever he might be, outranks Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, uh, which is a little weird when you think about it. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, they have four standard works that are considered inspired scripture. The Bible, Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, and the Book of Mormon. And they, they have articles of faith. And the eighth article of faith, notice this, this is critical, teaches that, and in fact I'll quote it, we believe to the, the Bible to be the Word of God insofar as it is translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. So the eighth article of faith denies the Bible is inerrant, which right there should distance them from Orthodox Christianity. Another belief is called families are forever. This is a key belief that for faithful Mormons, a family unit continues after death. What this means on is they go on and they are married into the eternities, uh, the, the same people you're married to while you're on earth, usually, and uh, you have spirit babies and you go off and you start your own solar system. Uh, if worthy, they can go to the temple and be sealed for time and all eternity and carry on their marriages into heaven and beyond. Another unique doctrine of Mormonism is baptism for the dead. For this reason, uh, Mormons are told they must do genealogical work. And many of you have probably heard that the Mormon church has the largest genealogical library of any, of any organization in the world. And that is true. They do. They've really done a, an amazing job of that. Uh, so they believe that there are three duties for every Latter-day Saint if they want to be faithful and true. The first duty is to preach the gospel. The second duty is to perfect the saints. And the third duty is to redeem the dead. So every faithful Mormon is supposed to go back at least four generations in their own family, both sides, and find out the names, all the vital statistics for those ancestors. If they can go more than four generations, that's even better. But then they're supposed to go to the temple and submit these names and then be baptized for their deceased ancestors by proxy. And the, the Mormon doctrine is, is that let's say, well, like for example, I had a great grandfather who, of course, was Catholic. And, of course, he's been dead now for many, many years. And I went to the temple back in 1980 or 81, and I was baptized for him. They, they said his name, and they, you're standing there in this huge baptismal font in the basement of the temple, and the guy says, you know, by virtue of authority of me and the Holy Melchizedek Priest, did I baptize you for and on behalf of uh, Clement Snebelin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Poosh, and he, they baptize you by immersion. And then at that moment, Mormon doctrine teaches that up in, there's a spirit prison somewhere up in heaven. And that all these ancestors are locked up in this spirit prison just waiting to get out. And as soon as that person is baptized, and then they go through and they receive their initiatory ceremonies and everything in the temple, through your work, then they get sprung from prison, they get presented the gospel, and if they believe in the gospel, then they get to go to heaven. So that's the way the Mormon church explains the problem of what happens to people who die without ever hearing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, uh, then there's the need for the priesthood. Mormons believe, as I explained earlier, that, that every worthy male should hold the priesthood. And without the Aaronic priesthood, nobody can be baptized. And without the Melchizedek priesthood, which is the higher priesthood, nobody can have any sealings or anything like that. And so there's no prophecy or no authority without the priesthood. They have what's called a sacrament meeting every week, and it's their version of like 
you know, communion, but it consists of water and wonder bread. The other thing they do that's rather unique is once a month they have a fast and testimony meeting. And what this means is, is that once a week, and I, once a month, I'm sorry, they fast. And that's, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with fasting, certainly. And they supposedly take the money that they would have spent on food for that 24-hour period, and they give it to the church, and that money is kept aside for helping poor Mormons. Again, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's, a, it's kind of a good idea. And then on that Sunday morning, they call it fast and testimony meeting. And anybody is allowed to get up and bear their testimony. That's the term for it. Where they get up and they basically say, oh, I, know, I love my family and I love this church. And I know this church is true. I know Joseph is a prophet of God. I know, you know, whoever is the current prophet is a prophet of God. And it's just the most wonderful church. And, you know, they go on and on and on. And um, it's a kind of mind control. Because they'll have little tiny kids that are two or three years old get up in front of everybody. And it's the cutest thing you ever want to see. They're standing there. I believe the church is true, and I believe just as a prophet in Jesus' name, amen. You know, and they go sit down. And, you know, I mean, in a way, it, it's, it's very admirable because it gets their young people used to speaking in public. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also kind of like mind control because you'll notice this when you talk to a Mormon and you're witnessing to them, if you start getting too close to the truth, they'll start bearing their testimony, which is sort of like their default you know, like reboot, 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 like a computer, you know. Um, now, they believe in temples and restored temple worship. Mormons are taught that their temples are built virtually identical to what the temple that Solomon built. They believe that the most holy thing they can do on earth is to go and partake of the temple endowments and be sealed for time and all eternity to their wives and their children are sealed to them so they can go on into the eternities and populate the universe. They have a teaching called the Word of Wisdom, which I mentioned earlier, section 89 of Doctrine and Covenants, which is the health code, no alcohol, no tobacco, no caffeinated drinks, meat only sparingly or in winter, although actually most Mormons don't follow that. Most Mormons eat meat all the time. They also have food storage in the bishop's warehouse. They do take care of their own. The Mormon church is very wealthy. It has its own welfare system. It has its own industries. It has church farms, church factories, church woolen mills. And, and yeah, if you are a poor Mormon, you will be taken care of. You won't have to go on the government welfare system. But on the other hand, they expect you to work. And there's nothing wrong with that. I, I actually think that's not a bad idea. Uh, that's the trouble. See, the Mormons get a lot of things right. But they get all the big stuff wrong. And that's what we're going to talk about. I want to explain something now. People say, well, okay, what makes something a false religion? Well, I believe there's basically four things that are non-negotiable differences about Orthodox Christianity. Number one, the nature of God. You've got to get that right. Who is God? Number two, who is Jesus? Number three, what must I do to be saved? And number four, the Bible and the nature of Revelation. Okay, let's examine Mormonism briefly in that light. Mormonism teaches that there is no trinity, that instead there's a polytheistic universe with millions of gods. God the Father is not a spirit, but a man of body, parts, and passion. So in other words, he's an extraterrestrial who lives on the planet Kolob. And their primary doctrine here is, as man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. That's called the law of eternal progression. So God the Father, our God the Father, is ruled by a committee of gods over him, and he could be fired. Okay, now we're going to look at what the Bible says about the nature of God. Because remember, the Mormons teach that God is a man. He has body, he has parts, he has passions. The Bible says in Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Now in terms of the idea of there being many gods, because uh, that's the doctrine of Mormonism, is that there's many, many gods. Isaiah 44, 6 and 8 says this, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel and Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have I not told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. That's pretty clear. Also about the idea of eternal progression, that God is constantly growing and constantly changing. Malachi 3.6 says, I am the Lord, I change not. And finally, about God's nature. Jesus himself says in John 4.24, God is a spirit. And they that worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. And it's interesting, because if you take that passage and you go over to Luke, in Luke chapter 24, verse 39, 
This is the post-resurrection appearance, uh, appearance of Jesus, starting in verse 38. The, the people are afraid. The apostles are afraid. He appears to them. And it says in verse 37, They were terrified and affrighted and supposed they had seen his spirit. And he, Jesus, said unto them, Why are you troubled and why do, you thought, why do thoughts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet. Now watch it. Uh, that I, as I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see that I have. So this gives a definition of what a spirit is. A spirit is something, whatever else it might be, it does not have flesh and bones. And since God is a spirit, John 4, 24, that means the Mormon God is a fraud. Now, moving along to Jesus. Now, according to the Mormon church, Jesus is the Son of God, but not Almighty God. He is our elder brother. Believe it or not, Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer, and he's the spirit brother of all the rest of us. He is the firstborn of many children. He was begotten on earth by God the Father. Now, now catch this. According to Mormon doctrine, God the Father came down from heaven and had sexual relations with one of his daughters, Mary, to conceive Jesus. Now, that right there ought to blow most any Christian right out of the water, but of course the Mormons don't teach this uh, openly that much. I never heard this until I was in the church for four years, and then I finally heard a general authority. In fact, I can tell you which one. His name was Elder Derek Cuthbert, a British fellow, teach this from the pulpit at our stake center. Now, the atonement also has nothing to do with the cross, according to Mormon theology. But the Bible says, first of all, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and of course that's Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is Almighty God. 1 Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, that's Jesus, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Okay, then concerning the virgin birth. There's nothing in the Bible about God the Father coming down and having sex with Mary. It says in Matthew 1, 20, But while he thought on these things, Joseph, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived of thee, uh, pardon, unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And then finally, Luke 1, 35 explains the mystery of, of Jesus' incarnation. The angel, an, the angel answered and said unto her, meaning Mary, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. So it's the Holy Ghost. It is not God the Father coming down and having sex. Now, in terms of salvation, Mormons, see, you've got to realize something about any cult group, whether it's Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, Catholics, whatever, they all use the same terminology that Bible-believing people use, but they have different definitions. Like, if you ask a Mormon, are you saved? They'll say yes. If you ask a Mormon, are you born again? They'll say yes. In fact, I had a Christian do that to me when I was a Mormon. Because Mormons believe when they're dunked underwater in a baptismal font, they're born again. That's what they believe. And I had a, I had a born again Christian. We were going to an Amway meeting, and, uh, and uh, this Christian lady came, are you, are you saved? And I says, yeah. Are you born again? I said, yeah. And then that was fine. You know, and it was like, you know. Uh, I wish then I would have had the gospel. It would have saved me three years of, of grief in the Mormon church. But anyway, Mormonism has a different plan of salvation. There are three degrees of heaven. There's, first of all, the telestial kingdom. That's like the bargain basement of heaven. Who goes to the telestial kingdom? Well, basically slackers. People of any religion or no religion are just sort of like clods. I mean, if, if you're not a very good Lutheran or not a very good Catholic or even just an atheist, you go to the celestial kingdom. Or if you're a backslidden Mormon, what Brigham Young called a Jack Mormon, you would go to the celestial kingdom. Now, the second level, and what is a celestial kingdom like? Well, you will live for all eternity in a place that's pretty much here on earth like it is right now here on earth. There's storms, there's disease, there's death, there's earthquakes, all the bad stuff that we have now in the world will be there then. The next level, which is a lot better, is a terrestrial kingdom. This is like the Garden of Eden. There's no death, there's no bad stuff going on. It's basically very paradisical. Who goes to the terrestrial kingdom? Worthy, hardworking people of any religion. So even if, this is the paradoxical thing about this system. You know, um, Lutherans, Catholics, Methodists, you know, even, even a, if you were a good Satanist, in living up to all the light that you had as a member of the Church of Satan, you would go to the terrestrial kingdom. Uh, most Mormons will only make it to the terrestrial kingdom. 
because they have not ever been to the temple. Now, who goes to the highest degree of glory, the celestial kingdom? Well, that would be Mormons who have been to the temple and who have been true and faithful to all the covenants that they make in that temple. And that's a virtually impossible job. So by their standards, only a tiny percentage of Mormons are actually going to make it into the celestial kingdom, which is where you get to become a god. Additionally, Mormons have a gospel of works. Somebody actually counted out that there are 4,000 commandments to keep in the Mormon church. You also need your temple endowments, being true and faithful to the four covenants you make in the temple. You make a covenant to the law of obedience, to the law of sacrifice, the law of the gospel, and the law of chastity. And if you break any of these, you're doomed. Now, according to Mormon theology, who is really damned? Well, in the, the greatest Mormon theological book of the 20th century was called Mormon Doctrine. It was written by Bruce R. McConkie. He was an apostle of the church, so this is a pretty high-level book. And he said uh, in page 234 through 236 that anybody who does not make it into the celestial kingdom is eternally damned. So that means if you are a Mormon and you have not done all these things that I just described, kept all these 4,000 commandments, gone to the temple, be sealed for time and all eternity, you're damned. Now imagine being in a church where probably 90% of the people, and that's being generous, are damned, guaranteed. <laughs> that would be a great selling point, wouldn't it? Now the final strange doctrine that Mormons have about salvation is what is called blood atonement. Now they'll deny this up and down that this is a doctrine but it's taught all over the early church and it's never been rescinded. This doctrine is kept very well hidden because it's so embarrassing. In the early days of the church in Utah, it was taught that there are five sins for which the blood of Jesus can never atone. These are like unpardonable sins. And here's what they are. Murder, adultery, homosexuality, apostasy from the true church, and marrying a black person. Those are the five unpardonable sins. And if you do any of these sins, the only way you can be ever guaranteed, oh, I forgot, there is, there is a fourth place you can go if you're really, really evil. Like someone like me, by Mormon standards, who went to the temple, had all the light of Mormonism, and I've turned my back on it, I would go to the outer darkness, which is a place that's so awful no one even knows what it is. <laughs> anyway, um, so if you do any of these sins, you will go to the outer darkness. But you have hope. If your blood is spilled out upon the earth and you are killed, then that blood atones for one of these five sins. That's why Utah is one of the few states in the Union that has a firing squad. Is because if you commit murder, you can ask to be shot. Because most ways that we, we, um, we execute people in America do not involve shedding blood. I mean, if you have a lethal injection or if you're hanged or if you do the electric chair, none of those things shed blood. That's that's why Mormonism has a firing squad. But of course, they will be the first to say, well, of course, we don't kill people now except for murder. But in the, in the, in the millennial reign when the church rules the earth, then all of these other things will indeed be um, death penalty sins. Now, the Bible, on the other hand, briefly, and I'm not going to belabor this point, but it says we are saved by grace through faith without works, and that's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Finally, what does the Mormon teach about doctrine, uh, divine revelation? Well, they say the Bible is flawed and insufficient, that it hasn't been translated correctly. It needs to be corrected by a living prophet. And it also teaches there's these other standard works, the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price. There are many problems with these texts that I don't really have time to go into. Uh, but one of them is, and this is going to blow your mind, because it sure blew mine when I discovered it. The Book of Mormon contradicts almost all of the Mormon doctrines I have just told you. So in other words, you can read the Book of Mormon, and the Book of Mormon will contradict what Mormons are teaching. Almost everything, like for example, the Book of Mormon teaches that there is a trinity. In fact, the Book of Mormon teaches more clearly than the Bible does that there's a trinity. The Book of Mormon teaches salvation by grace. Um, you know, all sorts of these things, and I don't have time to go into all of them, but just suffice it to say, that, that the Book of Mormon, which is supposedly the most correct book ever written, actually contradicts key tenets of LDS theology. Uh, now, they, as I mentioned earlier, the Mormons teach that a living prophet is always better than a dead prophet. Now, here's the problem, though. Subsequent prophets contradict each other. For example, Brigham Young, in his lifetime, said that no black person would ever receive the priesthood until every, black, every white man on the face of the earth had become a priesthood holder. 
But along comes Spencer W. Kimball and contradicted that in, uh, in 1978. Joseph uh, Smith said that no one could attain the celestial kingdom without having more than one wife. President Wilford Woodruff made an excommunicable offense to marry more than one wife. So it's like, er, 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 which prophet is true? And there's many other examples of that. Now, we need to look at the temple. We need to look at the, at the famous Temple of Doom. Now, when we entered the Salt Lake Temple again, we were witches, we were druids, we had all this background, and we had been told that the temple was a Luciferian initiation. And we're going to examine this now in detail. When you go into the temple, um, first of all, you cannot get in unless you have this special card. It's called a Temple Recommend. So only true and faithful Mormons that have been examined by their bishop and their stake president to be worthy are allowed into the temple. When you go in for the first time, you're taken through what are called uh, washings and initiatories and anointings. And basically, you're divested of all your clothing, and you put on this thing that looks sort of like a poncho. And it's called a shield. And oddly enough, it's identical to what we also had done to us when we were druids. Uh, then you go into this little cubicle, and all your bodily orifices are washed and anointed by members of the temple staff that are the same gender as you are. So, you know, it's a little bit weird, but it, it could be weirder. And again, this is very similar to what's done in witchcraft. It is believed in magic that this kind of anointing keeps evil spirits from entering bodily orifices. Then after you're washed, then you're anointed to be a priest and king or a priestess and queen, depending on your gender, unto the Most High God. And then after that, and this is the big moment, you're given the temple garment. Now, this is for your protection. And this is what I, I mentioned earlier is my magic Mormon underwear. And what it is nowadays is basically it's either a one-piece or a two-piece thing that's like a t-shirt and then baggy um, boxer shorts. And stitched on it are Masonic occult markings. For example, on the right breast is a square stitched into the garment, which otherwise looks kind of like a t-shirt. On the left breast is a compass. Over the navel is a gauge and over the knee is a gauge. And Mormons have a very superstitious idea about this garment. They believe it will protect them against danger. And like, you know, for example, there is this fellow whose name was Paul Dunn, who was a Mormon general authority, who was very famous for being a really entertaining and inspirational speaker. And he told the story about how he was in World War II over in, you know, the Philippines or New Guinea or somewhere like that, and that a tank rolled over him and he had on his temple garment, and the tank treads actually broke when they hit his torso because he was wearing his holy priesthood garment. <clears throat> Later on, this, they found out this guy was a pathological liar, and that almost all the stories he told were not true. But that illustrates the way Mormons believe, that they, they think this garment is kind of like a rabbit's foot, and it's going to protect them from danger, but God forbid if they ever take it off. When you ponder the incredible Mormon belief that their underwear protects them from harm, you realize that this belief makes their underwear into a satanic amulet or talisman. What is an amulet? Let us quote Masonic authority Albert Pike in his monumentally important work, Morals and Dogma. The Basilideans practiced the mysteries with the old Egyptian legend. They symbolized Osiris by the sun, Isis by the moon, and Typhon by Scorpio, and wore crystals bearing these emblems as amulets or talismans to protect them from danger. Therefore, the purpose of a talisman is to protect the wearer from danger, precisely the belief Mormons hold about their precious underwear. This concept is thoroughly satanic. You will find the satanic pentagram invaluable and indispensable as you attempt to draw from the infernal power of our Lord Satan. This extremely powerful amulet is the summation of the microcosm and is the summation of all the occult forces. In other words, there is no amulet or talisman more powerful as the satanic pentagram. Because the practice of depending upon an amulet for protection comes from Lord Satan, it is forbidden in the Bible. Listen. In Isaiah 3, God is pronouncing severe physical judgment upon Israel for her repeated sins. To make sure the people understand why they are about to be killed for their country, ravaged by the armies of Babylon, God lists the many sins which have angered him so greatly. Listen to just a couple of the verses of sins which moved God to physical annihilation of the sinners committing these deeds. In that day the Lord will take away the finery 
of their tinkling anklets, the caps of network, the crescent head ornaments, the pendants, the bracelets or chains, and the spangled face veils and scarves, the headbands, the short ankle chains attached from one foot to the other to ensure a measured gait, the sashes, the perfume boxes, the amulets or charms suspended from the ears or neck, from Isaiah 3, 16 through 19, quoted from the parallel KJV Amplified Bible Commentary. Why was God so angry that his people would depend upon occult amulets for their physical protection? God had earlier demanded that his people depend upon him for protection, not upon the satanic power behind an amulet. Therefore, Mormonism is proved once again not to be Christian. Their belief in the power of their underwear to protect them from danger moves God to furious anger and proves their beliefs to be paganism, the kind of paganism which originated 4,000 years ago. Now let's return to Bill Schneblin as he continues to talk about the Mormon magic underwear. So for example, let's say you're going to take a shower and you're a devout Temple Mormon. Well, you can't not wear your garment. So what you do is, you take your old garment off that's soiled and you let it fall down to your feet in the shower and you're standing there with the garment kind of puddled around your ankles. And you take your shower and you step very carefully out of the old garment that's of course a soggy mess in the bottom of the shower and you put your feet into the new garment that's sitting right by the tub. And you put your, your foot into the new garment and then finally you can step out of the old wet garment. That's how they do it. Similarly, if they take a bath, they have to put one foot out of the tub and dangle the garment over their foot. Um, Mormons will wear this garment when they make love as man and wife. They will also wear the garment when they have babies. They, they you know, basically you have to literally rip this garment off them. Uh, like if you go to the hospital, like an emergency room and they have to get this thing off you, you know, they'll, they'll fight you. You know, like if they need to give you a CPR or something. So it's a very big deal and it's a very kind of superstitious thing. Uh, now, there's all sorts of Masonic connections here already. Um, Joseph Smith, uh, well, I already talked about this to a degree, that he was actually introduced a lot of Masonic elements into the temple ritual. Uh, he was made a Master Mason on March 16, 1842, and then less than six weeks later, on May 4th of 1842, he gave forth this secret ceremony to all of his apostles. The secret handshakes that are taught in the temple are virtually identical to those in Freemasonry. The five points of fellowship that are taught in the temple are very much like, in fact, they are identical to those that are taught in Freemasonry. We'll go into that more in a couple minutes. Uh, the other thing that happens in this initiatory is that you're given this secret name. Now, this is interesting because when, when I was taken through this, I was given this secret name that nobody was supposed to know except me and, of course, God and obviously the temple staff. And then my wife was given a secret name when she went through her anointings and washings. I was allowed to know her name, but she was not allowed to know my name. Now, why is this? Well, Mormons are taught that when the morning of the first resurrection hits, that Jesus is going to rise in the east, and he's going to speak to all the righteous priesthood holders on earth. And he's going to call me by my name. My name, by the way, my secret name, if you really need to know it, was Joseph, which I thought was pretty cool because I was like Joseph Smith, you know. And I would rise up out of the grave at that moment by my new name. And then I would turn around to my wife, who was buried next to me, and I would call her forth by her new name. But see, if I didn't do that, I could leave her in the ground. <laughs> and Mormon men joke about that. But like, I, I remember hearing this one guy say, Honey, you burn that pot roast one more time, I'm going to leave you in the ground. And of course, you know, they're obviously joking, but it's kind of a weird situation because, see, in the occult, there's this idea that if you know someone's name, you have power over them. That's why it's such a big deal, like, to know the secret name of God or something like that, you know. Secret names are given initiates in every satanic coven in every era of time. The reason for the secret names was to protect the identity of the coven member, since membership in a coven was illegal in most countries throughout history. One of the most powerful of these satanic covens was Skull and Bones, located at Yale University in Connecticut. One of the common characteristics of elite Satanists is that they are required to take a secret name upon being initiated into the coven. However, the secret names of the specific bonesmen that Alexandra Robbins lists in Part 1 of her expose offer great spiritual insight into the true nature of Skull and Bones. 
The shocking fact is that the secret names Robbins reports are all curse names in the sight of God. Some of them were brought into physical annihilating judgment in the Bible. Some are end times names of demons, and some of them are worshipped as God in pagan religions. This fact alone should convince you as to the satanic nature of Skull and Bones. Robbins says new members of Skull and Bones are assigned secret names by which fellow bonesmen will forever know them. The name Long Devil is assigned to the tallest member. Boaz, which is short for Beelzebub, goes to any member who is a varsity football captain. Averill Harriman was Thor, Henry Luce was Baal, McGeorge Bundy was Odin. The name Magog is traditionally assigned to the incoming bonesman deemed to have the most sexual experience, and Gog goes to the new member with the least sexual experience. William Howard Taft and Robert Taft were Magogs. Interestingly, so was George Bush. Okay, now, after you go through all of that, you're given this little package of special temple robes, and you're taken upstairs to go through the endowment. Now, the endowment is the main part of the temple ceremony, and it's incredibly boring and repetitious ceremonies. And I frankly think it kind of puts people to sleep. You go through, and, and you go first, and it depends. See, if you go to the, one of the old temples, like the Salt Lake Temple, you actually see this done live. But this is very rare now. In most cases, you actually end up going to the temple in most cities and seeing this as a movie. And again, the movie is also very boring. But the first thing you do, let's say you're in the Salt Lake Temple and you're seeing it live. You, you're ushered into this creation room, which represents the creation of the world. You hear this disembodied voice on a loudspeaker talk about how God created the world and how it was created by uh, Elohim, who is God the Father, and Jehovah, who is God the Son. And then after that, Lucifer enters and te then you come to the garden and Adam and Eve are made in the garden. And Lucifer comes in and teaches most of the doctrine. And that's because of a rather peculiar Mormon doctrine. It's called opposition in all things. In the Book of Mormon, there's a book called Second Nephi. And in Second Nephi 2.11, it says this, For it must needs be there is an opposition in all things. If not so, Righteousness could not be brought to pass, neither wickedness, neither holiness, nor misery, neither good, nor bad. Wherefore, all things must needs be a compound in one. By the way, that's a good example of how lousy Book of Mormon prose is. This Mormon doctrine, called opposition in all things, is really the satanic concept of controlled struggle, known as the Hegelian Doctrine. The fact that Mormonism teaches this struggle between God and Lucifer and a further struggle throughout human history known as the opposition in all things offers another proof that Mormonism is Luciferianism. What is this Hegelian doctrine of controlled struggle? Conflict brings about change. Controlled conflict brings about controlled change. The Illuminati even has a formula. Thesis battling antithesis produces a new system known as synthesis. In this attitudinal change plan, two competing sides are required, constantly battling. Each side represents widely divergent views on a particular subject about which they are battling. However, the battling is designed to produce a compromise system rather than an absolute victory for either side. The German philosopher Hegel popularized this view in 1823 and called it the Hegelian system of conflict. However, Hegel did not originate this concept, but received it from a Freemason named Fitch, who was also a member of the Masters of the Illuminati. Our research has shown that this doctrine of control struggle was being taught members of the royalty in Germany and England as far back as the 14th century. Thus Mormonism is shown again to be Luciferianism, which is why Joseph Smith originally called his inner circle the Illuminati. So the devil comes in and he teaches stuff. And it's interesting, if you see this ceremony done live, uh, Adam and Eve are both wearing white outfits. The devil comes in wearing a black suit, white shirt, black tie, and he's got a blue Masonic apron on. That's important. Let us stop right here to examine the reason Lucifer is wearing an apron which is white with blue symbols. Why do Mormons depict Satan with an apron of a white-blue color scheme? All occultists believe literally in the legend of Atlantis that mythical land existing about 12,000 years ago in which the people were incredibly advanced in the practice of the magical arts. People did not talk for they communicated telepathically. They could levitate objects at will and could travel on the astral plane also at will. 
The average person was so advanced that they actually developed a third visible eye in the middle of their foreheads. The goal of all occultists is to change all the world so that the Atlantean system can be extended to everyone on earth. Now the highest level of Atlantean priests wore full-length white robes trimmed in blue and showing symbols in blue. In other words, the robes of this highest level of priests was shimmering white with blue trim and blue symbols. Therefore, this Mormon Masonic apron simply screams its occult origin. The devil teaches the law of eternal progression, which means that Heavenly Father had to eat of the fruit of the tree in order to become a god on his planet, and he's telling Eve that she has to eat of the fruit of the tree in order for the law of eternal progression to kick in on this planet. This is contrary to the Bible, which again says God does not change. And of course, it's irrational to believe that God could have ever sinned. But anyhow, Lucifer convinces Eve there's no other way for the law of eternal progression to happen except for her to eat of the fruit. So then Adam comes in and he's confronted with this choice. If he refuses to eat of the fruit, then Eve is going to be cast out of the garden. He's going to be stuck there all by himself with no mate to produce offspring. So he eats the fruit too, quote unquote, that man might be. At this point, let us examine the satanic symbol of Lucifer tempting Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Notice that the serpent in the tree between Adam and Eve is the occult Rosicrucian snake with the four distinctive tines in the top of his head. He has the fruit in his mouth, which he is presenting to Eve. The tree itself is drawn in the shape of the Egyptian Tau, a T, one of the most sacred of all symbols in the mysteries religion. Since it is the first letter of the divine child, Tammuz. Eve is seen here as accepting the fruit from the serpent, with Adam looking on, but notice he is extending an open hand towards the mouth of the serpent, supposedly awaiting his turn at eating the fruit. Adam and Eve have just been told by Lucifer that they must eat of this fruit so they can become gods. The Mormon man is proceeding toward godhood throughout his life. Now look above the Eden scene to the top of the genealogical chart with Adam on the left and Eve on the right. The handshake between the two charts is typically Masonic. This obvious handshake identifies this entire scene as occult masonry. Since Mormonism is heavily based upon masonry, you can understand why the creation drama which Bill Schneblin has just described with Lucifer given a prominent role is depicted in this Masonic scene of the Garden of Eden. Finally, notice that the entire Garden of Eden scene takes place under the watchful eye of the sun god and the moon goddess. These symbols are typical of these pagan gods. However, notice how the word God is presented right in the middle between the sun god and the moon goddess. Mormonism teaches that the god of this world, the sun god, and his wife have been given planet earth by the father god in order to populate it. This god is thus the Mormon father god. As you can see, this Masonic Mormon depiction of the Garden of Eden corresponds very closely to the creation drama which Bill Schneblin has just described. So they both eat of the fruit and then immediately their eyes are open and they realize who Lucifer is. And they say, oh, we see who you are. You are Lucifer who was cast out of Heavenly Father's presence. And he goes, yes, you're starting to wise up already. <laughs> and anyway, the first thing Adam does is he asks about this apron that Lucifer is wearing. And he says, what is that apron you're wearing? And Lucifer goes, this is a symbol of my power and priesthoods. And as if it ain't enough that he says it once, Adam says, power and priesthoods? And Lucifer says, yes, power and priesthoods. Now, right after he says this, the lights go up and this voice says, brothers and sisters, please put on your aprons. Now, everybody reaches in the little bag that they were given and they pull out this green satin apron that looks like fig leaves and they put it on. Now, am I the only one that that seems a little weird? Lucifer, in one breath, says that this is a symbol of my power and priesthoods, and then like a minute later, you're putting on an apron. Now, what you need to know about this is that the apron has an occult pedigree. In magic, and I document this in our book, Mormonism's Temple of Doom, the apron is associated with a third degree of ceremonial magic. In addition, of course, Masons wear blue aprons, just like Lucifer does, but the green apron is very similar to the apron that is worn by Satanists. It might surprise you to know that the Lucifer's sacred color is actually green. Now, why is that? Well, in the occult, Lucifer is identified with the planet Venus. 
And if, if you've ever looked at Venus through a telescope, it looks slightly green, just like Mars looks slightly red. Also, um, the sacred metal of Lucifer is copper. And copper, as you probably know, when it tarnishes, turns green. So therefore, Lucifer is associated with the color green. And they're wearing these nice green aprons. What you've got to realize is this whole scene is a very Gnostic interpretation of Genesis, with Lucifer being portrayed as a great teacher and a great initiator. Then patrons, the temple patrons, learn secret handshakes and signs. They have been modified since their book came out in 1987. They're a lot less creepy. But in my day, when I went through the temple back in the early 80s, these signs involved having your throat cut, having your heart ripped out, having your bowels ripped out, very nasty stuff. And all this related back to the doctrine of blood atonement. Such oaths are a clear violation of Jesus' commands in Matthew 5, 34 through 37, where he says, do not swear oaths. And those commandments are repeated in James 5, verse 12. Now, in the lone and dreary world, Adam and Eve are kicked out, and you're moved into another room. And each of these rooms, I should explain, is kind of like a small theater. There's like a couple dozen seats that people sit in to watch this performance. And Adam and Eve are at this altar. And Adam cries out to God in prayer. And he goes, Oh God, hear the words of my mouth. Oh God, hear the words of my mouth. Oh God, hear the words of my mouth. And Lucifer answers. Now how weird is that? Adam is praying to God and Lucifer answers the prayer. Um, now again, changes were made in the temple ceremony to clean it up in the early 90s. But one thing that they did back when I saw it is the translation of that was Pele Ale. God, hear the words of my mouth. Actually, not what it means. Pele Ale in Hebrew means marvelous false god. <laughs> Pele Ale. And because Joseph Smith wasn't a very good Hebrew scholar. And uh, so here he's saying, marvelous false god, marvelous false god, marvelous false god, and poop, out comes Lucifer. So Lucifer starts teaching more doctrine. And, but this time, however, Peter, James, and John show up in the lone and dreary world. Now, I know, you're saying, what the heck is Peter, James, and John doing with Adam and Eve? Don't ask. It's complicated. And they basically teach true doctrine, and they cast Lucifer out. Uh, before he skulks away, though, Lucifer says this, and he's actually in the, in the temple, he's actually talking to the people that are sitting in the chairs, the temple patrons, and he says, I have a word to say concerning this people. If they do not walk up to every covenant that they make at these altars this day, they will be in my power. And then he walks off. And I remember sitting there the first time I saw this, and kind of a chill went up my spine. Because it was like, yeesh, you know. Because at this time, you don't even know what these covenants are. So, that's a real pharisaical burden. So then you go to the terrestrial room where we learn the law of chastity. And there's not a whole lot to say about that. It just is basically you're supposed to live a chaste life and only have sex after marriage with your wife. Then we were taught the first token of the Melchizedek priesthood, which is the sign of the nail. And this is what it looks like. Now, this is very similar to a handshake that I learned as a Satanist. And you might ask, why is that? Well, we'll talk more about the nail thing later. The first grip, what I just showed you, is also identical to the grip of the York Rite, ninth degree in Freemasonry, the Knight of Malta. It is also identical to the eighth degree grip of witchcraft. The first token of the Melchizedek priest that is also identical to the Master Mason grip, the strong grip of the lion's paw. Uh, that's like this. I can't really do this very well without another person, but you get the point. Okay, then you go into the celestial room. This is approaching the veil, which is the real holy thing that you go through. Uh, this veil is nothing like the veil that was in Solomon's temple or in the tabernacle of Moses. It's a very flimsy thing. It's basically almost gossamer, and it has holes in it. Interesting enough, the holes are shaped just like the stitchings on the temple garment. They're a big square, a big compass, and a big gauge. First, you're taught the true order of prayer. Now, what would that be? Well, basically, there's this altar, beautiful little altar sitting there. It's like a marble pedestal with a upholstered cushion on top. It's about maybe, I'd say, four or five feet by three feet, and then it's about waist high. And all the people gather around it in a circle. They hold hands in this secret grip, and they pray for the prayer requests that are sitting in a little satin packet on the altar. 
Uh, this is very much the way in which his Sabbath is conducted. All the prayer requests are put in the center of the circle. Everybody holds hands in a circle, and they, except in the witch's thing, they all dance around. They don't stay still. And then we have, we are given the second name of the Melchizedek priesthood. Well, you hear this name. But this name can only be given through the veil by Heavenly Father who's on the other side of the veil. So what you do is you go up to this veil and you put your hand through these holes in the veil. On the other side of the veil is a Mormon temple worker who pretends to be God the Father. And he embraces you on the five points of fellowship. Now what are these points? Well, it's just like in masonry. They put their right foot up against your right foot, their knee up against your knee, their breast against your breast, their hand to your back, your hand to their back, and then their mouth to your ear. Those are the five points of fellowship. So you're basically embracing this guy through the veil. And then when you're in that embrace, under in a low breath, you are taught the most sacred thing in the Mormon temple. And that is the second name of the holy Melchizedek priesthood. And here it is. Health in the navel, marrow in the bones, strength in the loins and in the sinews, power in the priesthood be upon me, and upon my posterity throughout all generations of time and all eternity. That's kind of a mouthful for a name, wouldn't you say? That, that is what you have to be able to say to get into heaven. Now what's really bizarre about that name is that it's virtually identical, and we document this in the book, Mormonism's Temple of Doom, uh, of an incantation that is used in Satanism, in satanic ritual work. The only difference is, is that in Satanism, it's more vulgar. So, you know, isn't that kind of bizarre that the same exact wording can be used in the, the most holy and sacred parts of the Mormon temple ceremony as are used in Satanism? Now, the other thing is, is that once you are on this embrace and you've heard the name, you are ushered in by this man who's pretending to be God the Father into the celestial room. This is the holiest place in the temple. And it's, like, it's kind of like this real kind of snazzy hotel lobby. It's all done in beige and whites with nice decor and little sofas and tables and you know it's quite lovely. And you can sit there for a few minutes and supposedly bask in Heavenly Father's presence because Mormons believe that God the Father actually walks around in this room in their various temples around the world. Now if you're going to be married for time and all eternity that is the next step. You're taken upstairs to what are called the ceiling rooms. That's S-E-A-L rooms. And here you kneel at an altar in a room that's surrounded by mirrors. So you can look at each other, your wife and yourself, and you can see these mirrors. Now, now the most important thing about having gone through all this temple ceremony, if you're a Mormon, is that once you're in the celestial kingdom and you've learned all of these secret handshakes and grips, these guarantee that when you die, you will go through these various angelic guardians and they will ask you all these secret names and they will ask you these secret handshakes. And if you can't give them to them, then you don't get into the celestial kingdom. And what's weird about this is this is very akin to what's called the Tibetan Book of the Dead, where you need all these secret little things in order to get up to higher degrees within, within Tibetan Buddhism. So anyhow, the thing that you finally achieve by all this is what's called the promise of eternal increase. And that's the doctrine that you will have babies after you go into the spirit world and you will populate your own little heaven with these spirit babies. And then you'll get your own planet and you'll get to have your whole planet populated by millions of your spirit babies. And uh, then you get your own little plan of salvation and everything. And you become a god of your very own world. Now what's interesting about this is that this whole temple ceremony was so similar to Masonic ritual that for a hundred years the Grand Lodge of Utah, the Freemasonic Grand Lodge, ruled that the LDS Church was an illegal clandestine lodge and that Masons were not allowed to join the Mormon Church. However, that has been recently changed. There's also heavy influence from occultism. Now, what you need to understand about this idea of becoming gods is that exaltation could last millions of years. It could take millions of years. And what people don't think, these Mormons don't think this stuff through. Imagine if you're a sweet little Mormon wife. If you get to go to heaven and become a goddess, guess what your destiny is? You get to be eternally pregnant. 
Now, how many women would say, oh boy, I'll sign up for that. Plus, you've got to realize there's going to be more than you, you know, Mrs. Mormon. There's going to be other Mrs. Mormons up there. Because, uh, believe it or not, a Baptist missionary friend of mine who had a lot of time on his hands <laughs> figured out how many times God would have to have sex in order to keep up with the population of America. And basically, he'd have to be having sex just for America to pop out a new baby every like 25 to 30 seconds. <laughs> so basically, he would have to have hundreds and hundreds of goddess wives to populate this planet. So it's not just going to be Mr. and Mrs. Mormon up there. It's going to be Mr. and Mrs. Mormon with like, you know, thousands of other Mrs. Mormons. So how many women do you think would like to be part, be part of a celestial harem and be eternally pregnant? I don't think I'd want to sign on for that. But now here's the best part. You ready for the best part? Well, after you've gone through all of this, your eldest son is going to go down to the earth and he's going to go through a similar thing to what Jesus went through, be horribly tortured, nailed to a cross, and die for, you know, for the plan of salvation. Now, how many people would love to have their eldest son go through something like that? I don't think I would. So the whole Mormon plan of salvation kind of falls apart of its own logical fallacy. Now, we're going to look for a minute at LDS temple architecture and its occult roots. Um, this is an occult science that's part of high-level Freemasonry. And here's a big word, but this is what it's called. It's called megapolis somency. What on earth does that mean? Well, megapolis is the Greek word that means great cities. And omensi basically means magic. So like necromancy is the science of communicating with the dead. Megapolis somancy is the science of great buildings. And what it is, it's the magic of constructing buildings in such a way that they attract devils. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Now, there isn't, isn't a lot of this in print because it's very secret. But back in the 70s, Satanist, the head of the Church of Satan, in fact, Anton LaVey, wrote an article in his newsletter called The Law of the Trapezoid. And in there, he reveals some of this, that the way a house or a building can be built has a lot to do with what kind of spirits are drawn to it. Some houses or buildings are literally magnets for demons. And for example, there's a thing in architecture that's called a frustrum. A frustrum is, a, is like a structure where it's like a trapezoidal shape where it's cut off at the top. It's like a pyramid with the top cut off. And if you look at mansard roofs, which are very common on old houses, and especially on haunted houses, you think of like the famous Adams Family House, those are perfect for attracting evil spirits. That's how that shape came to be associated with haunted houses. Now what's interesting is if you look at the spires of the Salt Lake Temple, they are a form of trapezoids. Now the other key thing is what is called archaeometry, which is the ancient Masonic canon of using numbers in architecture. How many pillars that are on a temple or spires or whatever relates to the gods' worship in that temple. Also, the proportions of the temple have, have a lot to do with it. The old foot dimensions of a building can be critical, even more critical, what are the dimensions of a structure in ancient megalithic yards. All of this is the basis of magic. These numbers or dimensions can also attract evil spirits. There's four things that we can talk about here. The shape of the building, the pattern used in laying out the building stones, the ornamentation that is used on the building, and the numbers used in building design. Now, we're going to look at the Salt Lake Temple because it is considered to be like the Vatican of the Mormon Church. And there's a book that was published back in the 19, uh, early 1980s called The Salt Lake Temple, A Monument to a People. Now, this isn't an official church publication, but it's intended to be a very faith-promoting Mormon book. It's a beautiful coffee table kind of book with many colored pictures inside of it. It has loads of interesting historical and architectural facts about the temple. The book makes it clear that nothing in the Salt Lake Temple design was left to chance. On page 147, Salt Lake Temple architecture, we are told, was intended to be literally a compendium of LDS, temple, of LDS theology. It is an expression of st in stone of LDS doctrine. In page 48, we are told that every detail of temple design was under direct supervision of Prophet Brigham Young, especially the number of spires on the temple, which happens to be six. This is all supposedly divine revelation. They tell us it is a theological statement, but the, answer, the question must be asked, which theology? Is it Christian theology? Well, let me tell you this right up front. There are no Christian symbols anywhere on the Salt Lake Temple. There's no crosses. 
there's no uh, fish symbols, any of the things that typically we associate with Christianity, none of them are on the temple. But is there something much darker and more sinister? First of all, we see on the Mormon temple there are pentagrams, all-seeing eyes, Masonic handshakes are all over the temple as what are called bas-reliefs. Joseph Smith, before he was murdered, gave specific instructions to how all temples were to be laid out. The shape of the building is important. And the numbers used repeatedly in temple architecture is highly significant. First of all, the lack of a cross is significant. Paul in Galatians 6.14 said, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we should really wonder any Christian building that does not have a cross on it. Now, if we go to the west tower of the Mormon temple, uh, we see a picture here. This is known as the Big Dipper, and it's right on the west tower. Now, what is the Big Dipper doing on a Mormon temple? Well, of course, most of us know this is the constellation Ursa Major, the great she-bear. Now, what you may not know, in the darkest days of Egyptian religion, this constellation stood for the great dragon of space. And we document all these things, I don't have time to do it right now, in our book, White and Sepulchres. Uh, this is the dragon of the seven stars. This is the dragon with seven heads and seven stars, and the stars were crowns in the dragon's heads. It was known in ancient Egypt, this goddess, this um, dragon goddess, as Nuit. And this is from Alistair Crowley and the Hidden God by Kenneth Grant, page 123. She was known as the evil mother, the witch woman, and the goddess of night. The same dragon goddess is known as the mother of Set, or in Greek, Sothis. Set is the Egyptian version of Satan, just so we understand this clearly. Hebrew Kabbalists in the first century A.D., identified this same constellation, the Big Dipper, with Lilith. Now, Lilith is this kind of queen of all demons in, in Hebrew uh, superstition. She's the mother of all demons, the mother of all dark, evil, and lunar and menstrual currents of magic. And, uh, and of course, today she's become a symbol of feminism. Post-Christian writers identified this constellation with the great beast in Revelation 13, verse 1. This constellation is often identified with the most evil, famine-bringing aspects of Set and Egyptian lore. And you've got to understand something. In ancient Egypt, well, even in modern Egypt for that matter, their religion revolved around the Nile River. Because what would happen is, is the Nile would flood once a year. And it would flood its banks, and all this rich silt and water would be deposited on the land around the Nile River. And the Egyptians would run in, and they would plant their crops, and they'd have a heyday. It was wonderful. But then during the summer, especially during the month of what we call July, the Nile would recede to its lowest level. It was beastly hot, you know, because, of course, Egypt is in the tropical, you know, uh, latitudes. And uh, this was a very bad time. And this time was sacred to Set, this, this evil god. And um, it is also called by medieval magicians Typhon, the destroying dragon. Now, the Mormons in this book that I mentioned, the Salt Lake Temple, Page 145 says that, that that constellation is a symbol of the priesthood, those ordained by the Lord to minister to lost people, and that it is an intercessor symbol. Now, isn't that weird with all this dragon and set stuff that they think it's a symbol of the priesthood? Now, what does the Bible say about dragons? Well, I don't think we have to belabor the point. Revelation 12, 3, Revelation 13, Revelation 22 says it's the old serpent, the dragon, the devil, and Satan. So that's not a very wholesome association there. Okay. Now we also see that all over the temple are sunstones, moonstones, and star stones. It is generally believed by Mormons that these symbolize the three degrees of glory. However, according to this book, Brigham Young had an entirely different design in mind. Uh, they changed the earth stones. They were originally supposed to be Saturn stones and cloud stones on the northern and southern elevations of the temple. But these are not there. Uh, if you look at the slide you're seeing now, you will see how these earth stones, moon stones, sun stones, and cloud stones compare with the middle pillar of the Kabbalah on the Tree of Life. The topmost sphere of the Tree of Life is called Keter, and the clouds, this is the clouds that hide the face of Metatron, the great archangel of Keter. So there's an amazing correspondence here between the Kabbalistic Tree of Life and the stones on the Mormon temple ceremony, a part of the temple building, I'm sorry. Now, the problem with all this is it doesn't even fit with LDS theology, because in LDS theology, there's only three degrees of glory, and yet there's all these other extraneous stones. 
It doesn't make sense scripturally. It doesn't make sense astronomically. What are, what are, what are Saturn stones, for heaven's sakes? Well, in Greek mythology, Saturn is related to Kronos, the titan who devoured his children. In astrology, Saturn is considered the greater malefic. It's, a, it's like an evil planet. And, I mean, you know, very, very bad. And it's not acceptable to have occult symbols on a Christian church. Now, how about the pattern of laying out the temple? Well, instructions were given by Joseph Smith for this. And, and for example, the cornerstone is to be laid at the southeast corner, then to the southwest, then counterclockwise around the temple to the finish. Now, what's interesting about that is this is against the sun. Now, in the occult, this is what's called Wittershins, and it's only used in black magic. Now, why would Joseph Smith have the temple stones laid out in accordance with black magic? I mean, he was this wonderful prophet of God. It is considered to be against the sun, S-U-N, and also against the son of God. This would only be done in a temple of some dark god. The moon stones, which are on the temple, 50 of them all around the temple, were plotted out precisely month by month for the year 70, 1878 by Apostle Orson Pratt. He had his own observatory and did all these laborious calculations. Is this biblical? No, it is not. In Deuteronomy 18, 10, and 12, we are warned against the starry hosts, the hosts of heaven, things like this, and against observing times and seasons. That's from Galatians. The moonstones are laid out clockwise, which is sunwise. So here's the weird thing. The one thing is going one way. The one thing is going the other way. If you understand magic, that's to create a super double whammy of black magic when you have one thing going clockwise and the other thing going counterclockwise. And remember, an apostle of the Mormon church did all this. Now, what about the pentagrams? The Mormon temple is covered with pentagrams, both upright pentagrams and inverted pentagrams. Now, in the occult, this symbol symbolizes first and foremost the star Sirius. That's S-I-R-I-U-S. Sirius is the most ancient symbol of astronomical evil in recorded history. Albert Pike, in his Morals and Dogma, says that the blazing star of Sirius is the heart of every Masonic lodge. Sirius is known by anthropologists in the, as the stellar tradition in the cults of ancient Sumeria. Set, remember he's the Egyptian devil god, is related to Sirius, and his cult was so evil that later pharaohs actually defaced his temples and pylons. In the Egyptian pictography, we must remember, gods were shown to be animal-headed. Like, for example, Horus has the head of a hawk, uh, Anubis has the head of a jackal, while well, Set was shown to have the head of a dog. And, of course, you know, uh, the dog star is called Sirius, and it is part of the constellation that is known as Canis Major, the great dog. And that star is at its highest point on July 23rd in the Egyptian latitudes. Sirius uh, is sacred to the god Set. It is also called the Silver Star and related to the highest levels of the Illuminati, which is called the Great White Brotherhood. Herodotus, an historian, in his second book, page 58, talks about how evil Sirius is. Sirius rises in the east. This is the reason for the eastern orientation of many branches of magic. It is known as the Eastern Star, and that is the name of the Masonic Ladies Auxiliary. I don't have time to get into that now. But remember that the symbol of the order of the eastern star is an inverted pentagram, which is the star of Sirius. Believe it or not, as I was doing this talk originally back in the late 80s, I found out that on the Logan, Utah temple is an inverted hexagram. Now, you may have never even heard of such a thing, but a hexagram that's inverted is where instead of the one point sticking up, the two points are sticking up. That is the most profoundly evil symbol in all of magic, and it's right on a Mormon tabernacle in Logan, Utah. Now, is any of this biblical? Well, of course not. Jeremiah 19.23 warns against burning incense to the hosts of heaven. Amos 5.26 excuse me, talks about how evil it is that the, the Israelites had the star of their god, the star of Molech. 2 Kings 21.5 and 6 uh, associates the worship of stars with child sacrifice, with putting your child through the fires of Molech, and with Tophet. Now, Tophet is a place in the Bible where children were thrown after being burnt alive in the fires of Molech. Later on, it came to be known as the Valley of Himnon, or in the Greek, Gehenna, which is where we get our word for hell. Now, finally, we're going to talk briefly about the sign of the nail. You heard me earlier say that the sign of the nail is one of the names of the Melchizedek priesthood. But what we don't know is that the nail in Satanism is one of the titles of the devil. He is called the nail. 
because nails gave so much pain to Jesus Christ. Now we believe, but we can't prove, that the unique spires seen on, seen on many LDS meeting houses may very well symbolize the sign of the nail. The use of the spire or standing stone in the Bible is condemned in the strongest terms. It's a phallic symbol. It's a symbol of Baal worship. See 2 Kings 3, 6 through 7. The nail is associated in Western magic with the 16th path of the tree of life in the Hebrew letter Vav. Vav is, oddly enough, the Hebrew word for nail. The tarot card that rules this path is the Hierophant card, which in old days was called the Pope card. The Hierophant is actually an archetype for the great initiator who is Lucifer. He is the supreme high priest of all satanic mysteries. He holds the keys of satanic initiation. Now the question becomes, why are there six spires on so many temples? The Salt Lake Temple has six spires. The Las Vegas Temple has six spires. The Washington, D.C. Temple has six spires. Uh, each of these six towers in the Salt Lake Temple has 12 finial spires surrounding a 13th major spire. Now, you probably know about it, numerology. This is the occult science of breaking down numbers, and this is how this works. You have six towers times 13 spires. That six times 13 is 78. Seven plus eight equals 15. One plus five equals six. The numbers just happen to reduce to the number six. On top, of, on top of all that, there just happen to be 78 tarot cards in a tarot deck. That could be just a coincidence, though. Mm -hmm. The eastern towers of the Salt Lake Temple just happen to be six feet higher than the western towers. Brigham Young says he was commanded by revelation to have six towers on the Salt Lake Temple. Remember that. The Hebrew letter Vav is six and means nail. The gematria, the numerology of the false Old Testament Baal, is six. The gematria of Set, the Egyptian Satan, is also six. The priesthood of Satan is conferred in magic in the sixth degree. The most evil demon in Greek mythology was Sorath, whose name was added up to 666. The ceremonial magic square of the sun god adds up to 666. Six is the number of the evil star from Chaldean astrology, Sirius, which we've already mentioned. And of course, most Christians know that Revelation 13, 18 identifies the great beast with 666. But this gets even better. In Greek gematria, Cosmos adds up to 660. In the world, which is Greek, Ais Cosmos adds up to 666. Then you go to 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. It talks about the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition. In Greek, that's Anthropos, Anomias, Uios, Tas, Apuleas. Believe it or not, those letters add up to 666 times 6. You think there's something wrong with the number 6? Finally, the Greek phrase, the wrath of God, which is orge theou, also adds up to 666. Now we finally learn from the Salt Lake Temple book that I've been quoting from that the number six is symbolic of the power of the priesthood. Now remember how in the Salt Lake Temple, the Lucifer said that his apron was a symbol of his power and priesthoods? See, all of this hangs together. Now strangely enough, Anton LaVey, recently deceased head of the Church of Satan, is quoted in the official biography as making a prophecy. Back in the 60s, he said that someday Satan would rear up spires and tridents all over this land in defiance of the second coming of Christ. What's interesting is that, believe it or not, in Brigham City, Utah, there is a Mormon church where the spire is surmounted by a trident, three prongs. Are Mormons inadvertently fulfilling a prophecy from the head of the Church of Satan? The Salt Lake Temple is literally a compendium of LDS theology evil theology. It is all over the outside of the temple for anybody to see. You know what's funny? Mormons are always told, I remember when I was a Mormon, look to the temple. Look to the temple. It's our hope. You know, look to the temple. I tell them, look to Jesus Christ. Look to the true Jesus Christ. He is our hope. He is the author and finisher of our salvation. Okay, a couple of brief remarks about the, the political and sociological things of Mormonism. You need to realize that in spite of the way Mormons present themselves publicly, polygamy still exists. There are 35,000 polygamists in Utah that we know of, and uh, many people still practice it in the LDS church, although it's done under wraps, and I know that from my own personal experience. My bishop asked me to take a second wife, and thankfully I refused because Sharon would have no part of it. Then there's the patriarchal order of the LDS church. Women have little or no voice. Women are not allowed to be ordained. They are not allowed to hold into the priesthood. And of course, I've already talked about how resurrection morning, they might not be let out of their graves. 
There are massive social problems related to U uh, Mormonism. In Utah, which is of course the most Mormon state in the, in the nation, it has the highest levels of teen pregnancy in America, unusually high teen suicide rates, problems with spouse abuse, and many women are addicted to things like Valium and Prozac, which is not good. They're not allowed to drink, but they're, they're allowed to take Valium, which is of course alcohol in pill form. Now, you also have to realize that Mormonism is a political faith. It's very much a political faith. Uh, in, in the beginnings of Mormonism, they have what's called the United Order. They believe it's their prophetic destiny to take over America. They early on in the church experimented with communism, which was the United Order, but it didn't work very well. Communism never works very well. But they are taught that it will come back during the millennium. There's also the belief that is taught by prophecies within the Mormon church that at some time the Constitution will hang by a thread and the elders of Israel will be the only ones who can save it when it is about to be brought down. Now you need to realize something else. Mormons are taught that the United States Constitution is an inspired document, just like the Bible, just like the Book of Mormon, that it came forth by divine revelation. Now in spite of Mormons having this public image of being very patriotic, you know, very, very honorable people, what many do not realize is that up until the 1970s, Mormon people in the temple called down curses upon the President of the United States and upon the government of the United States and called upon God to avenge the blood of the prophets Joseph and Hiram Smith, who were of course killed in Carthage, Illinois in 1844. This was part of their sacred temple rites, and this has never been repented of. Now, there was also a secret elite order that Joseph Smith started in his day and is still around to this day. It was originally called the Council of Yitfif. Now, you might say, what is Yitfif? Well, Yitfif is 50 spelled backwards. Uh, that's real, real occult there, you know. And anyway, before it was called the Council of Yitfif, it was called the Illuminati, which is rather interesting. Within this council, Joseph Smith was crowned King of the United States. This council later on morphed into what was known in the 1970s and 80s as the Freeman Institute. And then in the late 1980s, the name was changed to the National Center of Constitutional Studies. This group was started by W. Cleon Skousen, who is well known among John Birch Society members. In fact, it's interesting that you will find that, generally speaking, John Birch Societies are more or less crawling with Mormons. And these are the groups by which the Mormon Church today maintains its political agenda as best it can. Then there's LDS political activism. Many, many Mormons are at high levels of the CIA and the FBI. At one time, four of the five Joint Chiefs of Staff were Mormons. Many of the highest presidential advisors have been LDS in the past. Significant LDS statements right now in the LDS church. In the past, we had George Romney, governor of, of Michigan. Today, we have Orrin Hatch, the senator from Utah, and Mitt Romney, of course, who we all know. There's then also, right now, just recently emerging, the interesting problem of Glenn Beck. He has been a major spokesman in the last year or two for quote-unquote right-wing Christianity, even though he is, of course, a Mormon. He does say that every now and then, and if you read any of his books, you find it out. And even though I think his ten intentions and goals seem to be good, this is a very troubling situation, partly because Christian people like David Barton are appearing on his show, giving him legitimacy, uh, but also one time he had the leader of the National Center of Constitutional Studies, which is a Mormon organization, on his show as a respected scholar. So he is, he is doing his best to mainstream Mormonism using his TV show. So one week you might have Jerry Falwell Jr. on the show, or David Barton, or some other respected Christian individual, and on the next week you might have a Mormon on, and there's no attempt to, to distinguish any of these. And as I mentioned earlier, remember, Glenn Beck believes the Constitution is divinely excuse me, divinely inspired. It most certainly is not. Glenn's persona makes him an excellent spokesman for conservative LDS values, and he may very well pave the way for fellow Mormon Mitt Romney to gain the Republican nomination, because what Glenn Beck is doing is he's mainstreaming Mormonism. He's making Mormonism more friendly, more cuddly, if you will. Um, and this is something that's quite worrisome, and I'll tell you why. Um, here is the problem with uh, someone like Mitt Romney or any other Mormon leader. Most people don't know Mitt Romney is a high priest in the Mormon church, 
and uh, he is, of course, a, a belongs to a very old, powerful Mormon family. And I don't deny that the guy is probably a very good administrator, a very good executive. I know he pretty much saved the Salt Lake Olympics a few years ago. But the problem is, is Mormons believe they have a destiny to take over America. And um, the way they think they're going to do this is they believe that when it is time to save the Constitution, quote unquote, that a Mormon will be elected president or vice president. Now, you've got to realize something. Mormons take oaths in the temple that they will obey the brethren over their country. And so therefore, every Mormon is actually a dual loyalist. They have their first loyalty is always to the prophet of the LDS church. And if a Mormon vice president is elected, they believe the president will die and then the Mormon will become president. And then they believe that he will be declared prophet. And this is where this, this so-called white horse prophecy comes in, uh, where, where Brigham Young and Joseph Smith both taught that, that uh, when the Constitution of the United States hangs by a thread, this one mighty and strong, quote unquote, quote, this one man would come in, either literally or figuratively, on a white horse, and he would save the Constitution of the United States and essentially set up a benevolent dictatorship. And he will bring back the United Order, which is this communitarian form of government that the U.S., um, that, that, pardon me, the Mormon Church had in the 19th century. And what's weird about all that is that it's very, very strangely like what we, we read in Revelation 6. In verse 1, it says, and when I, when I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the voice of thunder, one of the four beasts, saying, Come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse. And him that sat on him was a bow, had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, of course, most Bible expositors believe that is the Antichrist, the beast. And here the Mormons are saying that their prophet will be that. And it's important to realize that... Um, the Mormons are very wealthy as a church. They have done their level best to buy up thousands of acres of farmland, to gain control of food production in many parts of the United States. And this is what they believe their destiny will be. When a Mormon, prop, when a Mormon president is, is declared to be president, he will be made prophet and he will become the one mighty and strong. Now what's interesting is we close with something that kind of make you give pause to thinking about Mitt Romney as president. I'm going to tell you the shocking secret of the Washington, D.C. temple, which very few people know about. That used to be our temple. When I was a Mormon, it was the closest temple that we would go to to do our, our temple work, even though we lived in Milwaukee. Now there are temples much closer to Milwaukee, but back then it was the Washington, D.C. temple. This is a big, gorgeous temple. I think it's probably the biggest temple in the world, and it's in Silver Springs, Maryland. And um, when I was going there, I ran into a Mormon who was a Secret Service agent. And a lot of Mormons are in the Secret Service or the FBI or whatever. And he sat down with me and told me a secret. He said, do you know what's on the fifth floor of this temple? And I said, no. And uh, he said, well, you've noticed you can't go up there even though you hold a temple recommend. And I said, yeah, I noticed that. Because I was up on the fourth floor, I think it was, doing ceilings for time and all eternity for deceased family members. And I noticed you could not go up to the fifth floor. It was locked. And he said, there's a reason for that. And I said, okay, I'll bite. What's the reason? He said, have you ever seen an aerial photograph of the Washington, D.C. temple? And I said, no, I don't believe I have. And he took me to the store, the little you know, store that they have, and showed me a postcard that showed an aerial view of the temple. And guess what's in the absolute center of the roof of the temple? This very large hemispherical dome. And he said, you know what's under that dome? And I said, no. He said, that has all the telemetry that the White House has. It's so powerful that they actually have to reroute airplanes around the temple. And he said that underneath that dome is an exact replica of the Oval Office. And we believe that someday our Mormon prophet will run this country from the fifth floor of that temple. That's why that temple was built. And it's got... You know, he says, if you were in that room, you would think you were in the Oval Office. And that kind of, at the time, I thought that was wonderful, because, of course, I was a Mormon. But now I look at that, and I think, you know, that's kind of problematic, because the Mormon church believes its destiny is to become the ruler of the world and to create a religious dictatorship in, in which, basically, uh, if you aren't a Mormon 
or especially if you're someone like me, you very well could be executed. So, you know, you, you say, well, this is all kind of fanciful, and yeah, it might very well be, but you've got to realize something as we bring this to a close. I know everybody has their own ideas about who the Antichrist is and, you know, what, what the, the Great Tribulation or whatever is going to be like and, you know, all this stuff about end times prophecy. And I, I'm not taking away from any of that. But I guess you need to understand something, and I can tell you this from my background within Satanism. The devil sows many seeds in the hopes that some of them will bear fruit. Because unlike God, the devil does not know the future. Unlike God, the devil cannot really control the outcome of events. Because even though it seems to us right now that the world lies in great wickedness and that the bad guys have all the power, realize that this is a chess game where the Lord can come in at any time and wipe all the pieces off the chessboard. But all I'm saying is, when you sit there on TV and watch Glenn Beck, or when you look at Mitt Romney, especially as a potential presidential candidate, realize there is this hidden agenda. And I'm not saying these people are evil. I think both Mitt Romney and Glenn Beck are probably honorable men. But they are beholden to their prophet. And they must do what he says. And this can be a real problem. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen. I'm just saying that's what could happen. And the way things are going, it's anybody's guess. So I would just exhort you to really pray about your political choices. Uh, be careful. Be vigilant. Keep reading your Bible. And above all else, cling close to Jesus because He is our only protection and He is our only salvation in these very difficult and dire times. Thank you and God bless you. Now that Bill Schneblin has taught us how Mormonism is basically Luciferian black magic Freemasonry on one hand, while being a counterfeit Christian religion on the other hand, what should our response be? The 2012 presidential election will soon be upon us, and it looks very certain that Mormon leader Mitt Romney is going to run. But not only is he running, but mass media is portraying him as the front runner. Furthermore, Mormon talk show host Glenn Beck has joined forces with evangelical Christian lecturer David Barton to forge a combination political force of Mormons and evangelical Christians. Beck and Barton are arguing that evangelical Christians should join with Glenn Beck because he is stressing the Christian values of God and Jesus Christ and family. But Bill has proven that the Mormon God is not the biblical God and that the Mormon Jesus is not the biblical Jesus and that the Mormon family is far different from the biblical model. Should genuine Christians support a Mormon for any office? The Bible says emphatically no. Consider what God's Word has to say about Christians joining with non-Christians. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Second Corinthians six fourteen through 16 A Christian is not even to allow a deliberate transgressor into his house. Whoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Second John 1, 9-11 Does this scripture mean that any Christian who supports a Mormon for president will answer for it on rewards day, that Jesus will consider such a Christian to be a partaker of evil deeds? I believe it means exactly this. No genuine Christian should ever support a Mormon for any office, let alone the top office of the land. Do not be deceived. Now that you realize that Mormonism is a false religion, a counterfeit Christianity, we encourage you to receive the real Jesus Christ as your Savior. The real biblical plan is very simple and is based upon mercy and grace, not upon any works which you can do. What must I do to be saved? If you're asking that question right now, we would like to share the answer with you from the Word of God. Eternal salvation is trusting in Jesus' sacrifice alone. 
Here are six understandings to which you must agree if you are to become eternally and completely saved. These six doctrines do not come from the teachings of a man, but from the Word of God. Romans 3.23 tells us, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.12, There is none that doeth good, no, not one. We have all sinned. You have sinned, I have sinned. We must realize that a sinner sins every single day. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The punishment we have earned is death, eternal death in hell. But Jesus offers each of us the free gift of eternal life. Romans 5.8, While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus' blood sacrifice on the cross paid all the penalty for our sins, leaving no punishment which you have to pay. Now this is the crucial understanding in the salvation of your soul. Romans 10.9, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Because of Jesus' death, all you have to do is believe in him, repent of your sins, trusting his death as the sole payment of your sins, and you will be saved. Genuine salvation is just that easy to accomplish but your heart will be so filled with joy and gladness that you will willingly and lovingly serve Jesus the rest of your life. Romans 10.13 For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Notice that you are to be saved by calling on the name of the Lord. Saving faith is trusting in Jesus alone and in His blood atonement alone for the forgiveness of your sin. Genuine salvation comes from you speaking directly to Jesus. This is most important biblical truth. Romans 5 1 therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by rejecting the works road to salvation through the many good works which you may try to do during your lifetime and praying simply and directly to Jesus Christ you now have peace with him and are as assured of eternal salvation as if you were already there if you've genuinely agreed in your heart with these truths and if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, accepting his blood sacrifice on the cross, and if you believe God raised him from the dead, you are eternally saved. Jesus made a promise to us in John 3.36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. As a believer, you are as assured of heaven as if you were already there. Complete assurance. Jesus Christ is no longer hanging on the cross. That cross is empty. Jesus has risen, just as he said. You have just become born again. Listen to Jesus' words. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3.3 3. If you meant with your heart what you just said with your lips, you are now an eternal member of God's family.